A guy with dark hair is walking along the road, along the beds in which a man is standing. A farmer addresses him, calling him Kai and at the same time informing him that the wheat has grown. He offers to make bread as soon as it is harvested. Kai waves to the farmer, talking about his expectation of this moment, and continues on the road that leads into the forest. He has a fishing rod in his hands and a basket of fish on his back. The young man is met by four girls. They cheerfully greet him, noticing his lateness, and one of them calls him to her, since there is the best place calling him the king. The girls are sorting out a basket of fish. Other people and little people are visible behind them. A girl with silvery short hair named Ebis addresses the guy, calling him master. The young man turns his attention to her. The girl holds out a tray with a dish and asks him to try it, since she herself prepared this dish for him. Kai tastes the dish and, when asked by Ebis about the taste, replies that he would never have thought it was so delicious. Ebis is very happy, saying that she did it, and the girl with the long blonde hair next to her says that it all became possible thanks to their castle. However, this is too exaggerated, because this island was an unexplored land three months ago. It all started with the main character's past life. He was ill from birth and died before he could live for 20 years, lying on a bed with an Roman 4 drip. He was playing a video game console that had a farm-like game on it. Due to the fact that the main character was always ill, he thought that his parents were ill, but the hero was happy, because he was able to see his parents, who looked at him sadly. Before he left, it was no one's fault, but it was a life full of regrets. The hero was counting on a second chance. A small child's hand is lying on the ground. It's night outside, there are three moons and mountains in the background in a sky full of stars, and two children are lying on a stone sidewalk near a small river in the city. After a while, waking up, the main character opens his eyes and discovers that he is not in the hospital. He does not understand where he is and, turning his head, pays attention to the child, who is wrapped in a cloth, next to him. The hero is outraged that the child was left in such a place and begins to crawl towards him. However, he immediately falls on his side, and, having examined himself carefully, he realizes in horror that he is a child himself. But then he starts shaking, and the hero realizes that things are bad. The main character crawls up to the sleeping baby and hugs him, continuing to shake. At this moment, a man comes up to them and says something with a sad expression on his face, holding out his hand. The hero realizes that the person is not speaking Japanese. The man smiles sadly and takes the children into the house with him. The main character still does not understand the speech of the man who folds his cape. Lying in bed with that baby, he watches the man. The man strokes the hero's head. The hero examines his hands and accepts the fact that he has been reborn. The man is saying something and holding a tray with a plate in his hand. The main character sits on the bed and argues that, first of all, he needs to learn everything about the old world. After a while, the main character grew up. He opened the door and, looking around, went in, sitting on the floor. The boy left notes in a book. Two years later, they were accepted by the person who picked them up then. He gave the children the names Kai and Rukia. During this time, the main character found out that there is magic in this world and the like. Perhaps there is a god in this world, because it is a completely different world. At this moment, a girl with a bow on her head comes into the room. She draws the attention of the main character, who was a little scared of her arrival, to herself and informs that she will tell her father everything again. The boy, calling the girl Rukia, and asks her not to tell her father about it. Then Rukia says what will happen to him. He inhales and, standing on the stairs by the books, talks about the story about God. The girl joyfully shouts yes. God in this world is called Farley who created this world. The father of the main character and Rukia is a priest. The hero tells this story to the girl, looking at the books on the shelf. Sitting next to him and looking at the book, the boy says that there are 13 other gods along with Farley. Children who have received a blessing from God receive a sacred seal on the left half of their chest. By calling God's name, they are able to use his abilities. The main character calls his father a blessed person. After all, unlike magic, which is aimed at destruction, 
Abilities are not consistent. Rukia asks Kai about the possibility of becoming like her father. The hero thinks about it, and then says that the seal will be visible only when they become adults. Many of God's names are kept secret, and the blessed ones themselves will not be known until they receive the sacraments in the temple at the age of 12. However, one day the main character found an interesting book on the shelf among other books, and, opening it, realized that it was available only to the high priest and contained a name not declared by the temple. The boy continues to look at the book for a while, but when he heard an extraneous sound nearby, he immediately closed it, sitting in the same bathroom, in which a small ship floats, with Rukia and washing her hair. Kai worries about the possibility of using magic. The girl cheerfully replies that she will pat him on the head if he cries. The hero thanks her. After all, when he found out that he couldn't use magic, he cried for a very long time. Immersed in his thoughts about this world, Kai did not notice how he began to play with Rukia's hair. Who noticed it? He apologizes to the girl, but she turns her head to him, insists that it's her turn to wash him and grabs his hair. During the resistance, Kai notices something on the body in the area of Rukia's chest. Quickly running to his father, the hero loudly announces that the girl has a sacred seal. However, the father also notices the sacred seal on Kai's chest. After completing the examination of the children, the father says that he cannot believe it. In the background, Kai happily jumps and screams. Rukia turns to the boy, reminding him that she told him about it. Kai is a little embarrassed. The father draws the children's attention to himself and congratulates them. While hugging the children tightly, the man thanks the Lord, saying that these children are a miracle for him, and he is proud of them. Kai smiles at his father. Then he asks if anyone has entered his office, to which Kai, a little scared, replies that he does not understand what he is talking about. The sky is clear. Some names are heard in the middle of the silence. Kai is already ten years old. He sits tensely on the bench and looks sadly at the piece of paper in front of him, saying that nothing is happening, no matter how much he talks. The hero reasons that the names of these ten gods were in the book, perhaps his god among the other three. He thinks that he still needs to go to the official blessing ceremony, and he also wants to check the office, but it is closed. Looking down while lying on the bench, the hero begins to do a press exercise, reasoning that he trains every day, but he is still worried. Rukia turns out to be behind him, who clarifies that he is training again. Kai stops, noting that she, after all, knows about his note. He asks about her desire to know what kind of god she has. Rukia replies that her father told her it was a secret before the ceremony. However, Kai clarifies his question again and gets a positive answer along with the super cute smile of the girl. The main character suggests starting with the gods he knows. He lists the names of the gods, and Rukia repeats after him. And on the name of the god idea, a light appears around the girl. She is very happy with the result, saying that she hears a voice. Rukia asks Kai if she has become a saint. He replies that it may be. Kai notes that Adia was a pretty powerful god of truth, and he shouldn't have touched the note. The girl sits down next to the hero. Then the boy asks her about the possibility of using magic, and asks her to find out the name of his god. Rukia clarifies whether it is necessary to use it on him, and, having received a positive response, suggests starting. The power enveloped her. Rukia had a large eye in her hands, in which Kai was reflected. With her eyes closed, she reports that she sees God, who blesses him, and this is Alamir. Kai realizes that this God is not in the note, which leads him into thoughts, and Rukia asks about her talent and awesomeness. The hero laughs and pats her on the head, saying that she is super. The hero asks the girl about her awareness of the power of the goddess Idea. She replies that she did not understand anything except the name of God. Kai notes that the facts about his past life and the fact that their father is adopted should not be known to her. He thinks he can't be caught in a lie and wonders if his sister has good abilities. Kai looks at the seal, which is covered with a cloth on top, and realizes that with this he is one step closer to becoming a saint. When you become a saint, you immediately start working as an assistant priest in the temple. The hero thinks about what he could not do in his previous life, 
and decides that he will be a good son in this life. After all, they could be dead now if they hadn't been picked up by a man, they can become priests and thus repay the debt to their father. After closing the curtains in his room, Kai stands by the bed and uses the ability that the god Alamir Tenohira gave him. After a while, Kai found himself in an empty field surrounded by a fence and under the bright sun. He saw a sign next to him that said that this was the village of Tenohira and it was up to him to decide what would happen on this land. The hero realizes that the sign is written in Japanese. He squints his eyes and, looking into the distance, is surprised. He says that this village is literally like the world in the palm of his hand and this special ability is beyond imagination. Continuing to look into the distance. Kai wonders if the level rises if the condition is met, because as he understands, this is the small garden of his dreams, he smiles and stretches his arms up, rejoicing that he will begin to improve alone. The tip of the stick hits the ground. Kai runs down the street and answers the question of a standing woman that he is not shopping positively. Having reached his house and entered the room, the door to which he closed, the hero utters the words Tenohara village and disappears, finding himself in the village. The main character reads the sign and learns the condition for raising the level. And this is the first harvest. Remembering the harvest, he unwinds the rope on a stick and it turns out that it is a tool for digging up the earth. Despite the fact that Kai spent most of his savings on it, he considers it a good investment to start with. The village of Tenohara is what he received from the god Alamir for development. However, he wants his own world. After trying out the tool, the hero realizes that it is quite easy to use. The basic rule is that he will hear a mysterious voice about the appearance of a new ability. It is expected of God with his capabilities. After digging a short distance, Kai realizes that he forgot the seeds. When he goes outside the village fence, he finds himself in a place where he can use his skills. The main character approaches the table and, taking a bowl of seeds, realizes that despite the fact that the field is good, it is still not enough. He goes to the forest in the village and, noting that he is still surprised by everything around him, the hero says that everything is ready to collect materials. Kai argues that this forest is not enough and takes a sapling of a young tree. The hero argues out loud that wild berries and flowers, it will be good if there is humus in the village. The hero asks for a stone from a quarry from a man. After all, humus plays an important role in the formation of the village, and the harvest begins to grow better than usual. Kai was absorbed in finding resources and transforming the village. However, there is one thing, but when Rukia volunteered to help him, and Kai was glad of it. They joined hands, and Kai moved. It turned out that only things could be moved to the village. Rukia stayed where she was. In addition, you cannot stay in the village for more than one day. While the hero was digging up the ground, he suddenly moved into the room and damaged the floor, which he covered with a carpet. After all, at the end of the allotted time, you leave the village. With such success, the main character expands the farm in a few days. Kai looks at the work he has done and sees that the trees he planted outside the fence have already grown enough. The hero argues that the changes in the village are spreading outside, which is good, but it seems that for some reason the growth has been bad lately. Kai decides to look at the seedlings and is horrified to discover that everything is ruined. Potatoes and seedlings died, but it is unclear why. The boy argues that it is possible because of the soil. However, after looking and digging a little, and then looking at the sky, he realizes that there is no rain or clouds in this place. He wonders what to do with the weather, and, after standing for a while, decides to cause rain. Having broken branches of a tree and built a large flame, the hero argues that smoke and a natural fire should cause rain. However, he is not sure that it will help him from a smart point of view, but right now it is the only thing he can do. After extinguishing the flame, Kai looks at the sky and, after waiting a little, he discovers that it has started to rain, which turned into a heavy downpour, under which the main character rejoiced. Rukia, who is walking past Kai's room, bumps into him completely soaked. She asks what happened, and the hero explains what happened. Drying himself with a towel, he realizes that the problem with the rain has been solved. Rukia puts the wet t-shirt in the basket, and continuing to reason, 
The hero concludes that if he digs a ditch, he can make a river, then there will be more opportunities. The girl looks at her brother questioningly. A year later, the main character in the village inspects the beds, and when he finds the fruits, he pulls out his first harvest. At this moment, messages appear above his head congratulating Kai on completing the first task, raising the level to the first and increasing the rank to land reclamation. The hero was a little scared by unexpected messages. Kai notices the mysterious voice in his head again and immediately notices that the table has been updated. He runs up to the sign and reads that for the next level you need to reach 10 inhabitants. The hero is very happy about this event. The main character understands that the next goal is only part of the problem and he doesn't care. The hero can't wait to taste the potatoes and sit by the campfire watching them cook. Finally, he takes a baked potato out of the fire with a stick, as someone appears nearby who says that it smells delicious. Turning his head, Kai notices that this someone is an elf girl. He is a little surprised by the picture he saw, and after prolonged eye contact silently gives her one baked potato. She thanks him. After trying out the baked potato, the girl admires the taste. She says it's the first time she's eaten something so delicious. The main character asks who she is and where she came from, to which the girl tells him that her name is Enel and he knows her origin, calling him Aru. The hero doesn't understand what she's talking about. Then Enel explains that this is his own world, and she is his support in improving this world, the manager of the village he is creating. She explains to Kai that he can now make changes in this world. Kai says he feels happy. The elf girl notes that the food was not bad and even delicious, and she hands him a bag, saying that she will give him more of this. When the hero asks what it is, she explains that it is seeds, a reward for the first level. Kai asks what will grow from this seed. Enel suggests to see what will grow out of it, because she can only plant in the outside world, imagining a bad development. Kai refuses to accept these seeds, because if something strange grows, his ability will be revealed. After a while, residents appeared in the village, a family of three. Kai notices them and notes that it looks like a migration of primitive people. Then the main character approaches the man and holds out his hand, greeting them in the village of Tenohira. The man passes by, completely ignoring the hero of his attention. Kai is upset that he was ignored, and the elf girl in the background explains that they do not see him, since he is the god of this world. The main character, along with Enel, who eats, sits and watches the primitive people who came to the village. Kai wonders how he can increase the number of people, and then the girl suggests making life in the village easier. The elf says that the first necessity in life is a special meal, with which the hero agrees without hesitation. In the outside world, in the forest, Kai reasons that they will grow materials and collect cannabis, since it can be used to make ropes and clothes, and you can also eat its seeds and use oil. He argues that in addition to potatoes and beans, you can bring river shrimp and small fish. After all this, thanks to Enel, the cultivation progressed, the village and the inhabitants were changing rapidly. Kai was happy that the village had grown, and then, a year later, he and Rukia turned 12, and therefore the time for the blessing ceremony had come. Rukia addresses the main character about her appearance, dressed in an elegant dress and with her hair pulled back. The hero replies that she is pretty and now he is worried about strange insects. The girl laughs at his words, saying that she also loves insects. And Kai notices that this can become a problem and the father will cry. Sitting together on a bench, the guys reason that when this is over they will become disciples of a priest. Rukia asks if Kai's strength is okay and gets a positive response. Kai says that maybe the power will activate when he calls the name of God and you shouldn't get upset. At that moment, the door opens and the priest invites Kai. Rukia asks to get mad at her too when it happens. The hero agrees and replies that this is his plan and he will cope with it. He approaches the priest. The priest asks to see the seal. Kai reasons that the seal has been hidden under the sacred cloth for almost 10 years and today he will finally say goodbye to it. The man removes the cloth from the seal and, seeing the sacred seal, is horrified. Kai pays attention to his seal as he sees it for the first time. The priest is silent, 
which makes the boy nervous. The hero asks what is the matter, but does not receive an answer. The priest is staring intently at something in the book. Using a lens, Kai realizes that something is wrong, and he has a bad feeling, as the ritual should have gone smoothly. At this moment, a man in a black hoodie approaches the priest. The man calls him the Inquisitor and, after talking for a while, the Inquisitor turns and says, looking ominously at Kai, the evil god. The main character gets very scared, and at the same moment he is grabbed by priests from both sides by the hands and tied up. The boy is taken to the ship and thrown violently into a prison cabin. Kai doesn't understand what happened. He thinks that even the priest does not know about Aramil's seal, and for what reason he is an evil god. Kai wonders that he will be executed, and is upset that he did not say goodbye to his father and Rukia. A ship cuts through the water at night. Morning comes, the main character wakes up when a sturdy tall man enters the cabin with a bat in his hand. The boy is taken out of the cabin under the supervision of two men and taken off the ship. Kai sees a large island and, finding that the bridge to the ship has been lifted. Leaving him alone on the pier, he gets scared. The main character stands and looks at the departing ship, asking it to return. Now he completely does not understand what is going on here at all, because he was left alone on a huge island in the middle of the sea. The hero looks at the sea and notices that this is the first beach he sees in this world. However, Kai does not understand what he has forgotten on this beach. The hero argues that people don't exactly live on the island, so he doesn't understand what needs to be done and he needs to think about it. At that moment, there is a growl behind him. Kai turns around and asks if anyone is there. However, he discovers a large ferocious lion behind him. Kai is frightened by this development of events and backs away from the lion, and when the ferocious beast attacks, the boy manages to utter the words and move to the village. Sitting in a state of shock, Kai realizes that danger was near. Enel, who is eating potatoes, immediately notices him. She asks what happened and, noticing how much the hero is sweating, offers him water. At the same time untying his hands, Kai thanks her. Having untied all the ropes and told about everything that happened, Kai admits over a cup of tea that if he had not been blessed, he would have died. The elf sympathizes with him. The main character realizes that it is better for him to be in the village in the near future. However, Kai argues that he can stay in the village for only three hours a day, after which he will not be able to get to the village for a whole day. Therefore, he will not be able to hide here forever. The hero asks Enel if there are weapons in this world, to which she replies that since wars and the concept of war are not here yet, since victims do not exist here either, then there are no weapons here either. The best thing they have here is a stone axe for harvesting and an iron hoe that he himself brought into this world. Kai says he's curious about what's going on outside the village. The girl replies that it's an isolated world, so she doesn't know it either. The hero realizes that when he returns, a fight may begin and he must either fight or he will disappear. Then the main character takes an iron hoe. Enel supports him and says that everything will be fine, especially since he has the protection of the god Aramil. The main character remembers that this god is considered evil and goes beyond the fence of the village, finding himself in the outside world. Holding a hoe in his hands, he looks around and is glad that the lion is gone. However, at the same moment, a large boar with good tusks appears in front of him. The hero gets scared and does not understand what is happening on this island. Calling it a monster paradise, the boar begins to run quickly towards Kai, who in turn was already planning to return to the village. But then someone quickly grabs his hand and forcefully takes him away from the boar at high speed. The hero notes the stranger's great strength. He notices that a man is leading him. Therefore, people live on the island. They stop in a clearing, in the middle of which there is a large spreading tree. Kai starts to ask, but is interrupted and told that the monster cannot get close to these trees. The hero's hand is released. The main character sees a cute girl with short hair in front of him, which puts him into a little prostration. However, at this moment she immediately goes further into the forest. Kai doesn't have time to say anything to her, only returns to reality and to the big boar behind him. He turns to face the beast and covers himself with a hoe. When the monster turns back, the hero admits that the beast truly cannot approach. Kai sits down next to a tree, leaning on it with his back, 
and does not understand why the temple sent him to this place. He argues that this is too much of a workaround for his murder. The hero remembers his father and Rukia, missing them and wondering if everything is okay with them. The main character tightens his grip on the hoe in his hand and thinks that he must survive anyway. He realizes that he cannot return to the city and will live on the island, assuring himself that he would be able to live on the island for at least one day. Dawn comes, Kai lies by a tree and shivers all over from the cold, his teeth chattering loudly. He moves to the village and shouts that he is cold. His confidence from yesterday has suffered. Enel immediately discovers him and smiles at him. Enel gives him a drink of water, which surprises the main character a little. Kai explains that he needs to make a bed and a hut for the night, because if he does not cope with this, he will die. The elf girl thinks a little, noting that the locals still lack technology because they have neither nails nor tools. She says that a house with her own hands is possible, but you need to prepare materials and take plants from the village. Kai says it will help him a lot. Returning to the outside world again, the main character brought prepared materials from the village to build a house. The hero lists the materials, a log with peeled bark, small branches and leaves, stone tools and believes that this should be enough for a hut. Kai remembers Enel's words about the possibility of taking materials from the village right away. He can just turn to her if he needs something and mentally rejoices that he can raise the level. He decides to dig up the ground first and determine the size of the hut. The hero begins his work and notes that the soil here is hard compared to the village. Continuing to dig up the ground, Kai realizes that he cannot spend much time on this and now he just needs a room in which to sleep. Working hard and making every possible effort, the main character begins to make the walls of the house. He would like a hearth so that he could keep warm, but as he expected, this will not work. Moving on to the roof, Kai argues that thanks to the large trees, you cannot worry about the rain, so he will make small gaps for light to penetrate. At this moment, he notices that the girl who helped him escape is watching him from behind a tree. The hero recognizes her, and as soon as he addresses her, she immediately leaves. This upsets Kai somewhat, he does not understand her behavior. By evening, the main character still managed to finish the hut. For himself, he learned that cannabis emits an insect repellent smell, because all the materials were taken from the village. Kai falls with relief onto the bed, which is made of fallen leaves and shavings covered with linen. He thinks about what will happen tomorrow and falls asleep. The next morning, sunlight hits the hut, and the main character wakes up. The boy shivers in bed, saying that this is different from everything before, and he does not want to get out of this place. However, after thinking a little, Kai moves to the village, where Enel meets him and asks about breakfast. Sitting at breakfast, the hero notices that many plants have grown in the village, and the elf adds that culture has also risen. He talks about easy difficulty levels, as there is food and water in the world. Kai wonders if one day he won't be able to use the ability, he'll get stuck, so he needs a field on the island. Kai thanks Enel for the meal and informs her that the plan for the day has been determined. She turns to the hero, saying that if something new appears on the island, she will help him, and it will definitely help him. After all, if something turns out to be very tasty, the girl will be happy. Kai agrees with her, noting how, by the way, to have a friend with a good attitude in such a situation. Returning to the outside world with a bucket in his hands, the hero argues that, despite his dislike of field work, he does it to prevent risks. However, he notices fruits near the hut. There were four oranges on a large leaf. And as soon as Kai raised his head, he found a girl who was still watching him from behind a tree. The main character turns to her again, but she disappears again. Kai speculates that she may have brought the oranges or the local people from the island. Looking at the orange in his hand, Kai thanks the girl and informs her that he will live. The boy pushes the girl away shouting that she, the demon, should not approach him. He rushes on running with all his might. The girl screams at him to take care, but the boy did not see the huge mouth open in front of him. The girl only silently watched as the boy was eaten by a big lion. She stared at the floor and crumpled the earth under her hands. Kai stands, thinking a little about the edibility of fruits and carefully examining them. Then he remembers Enel's words and her desire to help him in his search for delicious food. Moving back to the village, the hero shows the girl fruits, which makes her ecstatic. 
The main character thinks that the fruits are poisonous while watching Enel trying. The girl immediately informs him that the fruits are sweet and sour and quite tasty. Kai is surprised. He also takes a sample and makes sure of Enel's words. And the elf girl talks about the strong aroma of fruits and whether the inhabitants might like them. Kai asks if she can plant them, and she says that they were lucky, and now this fruit is available to this world. She explains to him that this fruit began to exist in the village of Tenohira because Kai brought it here. Enel reports that time goes several times faster during Kai's absence, so it will be easy to grow fruits here. Upon returning to the island, the hero decides to leave everything to Enel and start farming on the island. Two days later, the main character has already dug several beds around the house. Kai decides that this amount is enough, and now he needs to plant potato seeds. He turns his attention back to the girl watching from behind the tree, but as soon as he waved at her, she disappeared. Kai, who is already used to this behavior of the girl, compares her to the neighbor's cat, although this expression suits him better. The hero finds the fruit on the leaf again and says that he needs to thank her for the fruits that she leaves every night. Thanks to this, they will be able to grow them in their village. A terrible sound is heard behind him, abruptly turning around. Covering himself with a hoe, the hero discovers a wild boar wandering around behind him. Already in the village, Enel, eating an orange, asks Kai about his question about the introduction of the weapon. He offers to bring such a weapon as a hoe and distribute it around the village. The girl says it will be quite difficult. After all, as she said earlier, there are no enemies in this world. Kai understands this. Then Enel offers to launch one monster from the island into this world. Despite the fact that it is dangerous, the village will be destroyed, but the people will immediately learn how to fight. The hero does not agree with her, and, looking at the man with the children, Children, says that it is better not to. Military power is needed, but you cannot win using pseudo-weapons. At that moment, Enel calls him and shows him the bag, asking if he has forgotten about it. Kai thinks about it and asks what it is. The girl is very surprised. Then she reminds him that these are the seeds of creation a reward for leveling up. The boy immediately remembers them. Enel offers to plant them and says that I'm sure it will be useful. The main character examines the seeds in his hands. In the outside world, Kai is engaged in planting seeds and hopes that this will help him survive on the island. Inadvertently, he remembers a man with children, and then him, along with his father and Rukia. Kai realizes that he cannot depend on his father, since he is the high priest. Perhaps he will come for it when he realizes that something is wrong. Looking into the distance, the hero realizes that it is not worth just waiting for his father, and it is worth preparing the ship. At this moment, a girl is watching him from behind a tree. The next day, Kai does not feel well. As he caught a cold, he believes that this is not a local disease, and since he has been in the village for a long time, he cannot. One can only hope for his immunity. The hero feels his body shaking, and although he is used to this feeling from a previous life, it is still unpleasant. He is haunted by the feeling of death and cold, and his health is very bad. Kai curls up more tightly under the covers. He opens his eyes and sees a girl from the forest in front of him. She asks about his condition, and the hero immediately recognizes her. He reaches out to her with a trembling hand and jerks her down next to him. This surprises her. Holding her tightly to him, Kai feels warm. The next morning, the guys are lying down, watching and greeting each other. The girl says she's glad he's not dead, sitting on the bed, the hero becomes embarrassed for his actions. He thanks her. The girl asks if he is afraid of her. Kai carefully examines the girl, noting the features of her appearance, and recognizes her as a phallic demon. He believes that the children of this world would be scared of her. The hero says that the girl is actually cute. She is embarrassed and, after some silence, clarifies if she is not afraid, receives an affirmative answer. The demon sits down close to the hero, asking his question again. This greatly confuses the main character. He does not understand why she sat so close to him and notes that he will be nervous if she continues. She understands, he's not scared. Kai asks if she's here because of the ritual, but the demon says she was born here. Then the main character clarifies about the other inhabitants of the island. The girl replies that she is alone here. The demon explains that there 
were still children before Kai, but they were afraid of her and died either from monsters, or they weakened and fell ill. She couldn't help anyone, so she was left alone. The hero is angry at the temple. Kai looks at her knowingly, saying that she saved him, brought him to a safe place and carried fruits, and was also with him when he got sick. So she is not alone. He holds out his hand to her and introduces himself as Kai Husqvarna, offers to become friends. She takes his hand and introduces herself to Abbas Des. She is glad to meet them and calls him master. The hero does not understand why the master is, and Abbas only informs that Kai is her master. Morning, Kai yawns, he sits up on the bed and stretches, and Abbas, who hugs him by the neck, wishes him a good morning. The main character is confused by this behavior. She is interested in his well-being, sleep and whether he was cold at night. Kai assures that everything is fine. He praises her bed and is immediately embarrassed by what he said. Abbas, smiling, says that she is glad. However, the hero is worried about the idea that she might pick up a bad guy in the future. He finds himself thinking like an old man, and from that moment on he starts living with Abbas, because it's wonderful not to be alone. The girl waters the seedlings and informs Kai that she has finished watering. He thanks her noting that field work to strengthen the hut is much easier when there are more people. However, the main food is still potatoes and beans. As expected, the diet needs to be varied. Abbas asks what kind of sprout is separately fenced. Then the hero explains that this is the seed of creation, and he does not know what will grow out of it. He would like it to be cereals, because in the future he wanted to switch to meat. Abbas asks if meat belongs to fruits. Kai imagines meat growing on branches and admits it's creepy. It was unclear to them what would grow from the seed, but after a few days of the growth of the sprout, the child grew. This surprises the guys. Kai asks what to do, and she offers to harvest, sitting next to him and with a shovel in her hands. This surprises the hero no less. She remembered that he wanted meat and asked if he could eat it. He refuses to do it. The guys look closely at the creature and the main character agrees to pull it out of the ground. Abbas enthusiastically agrees. The hero realizes that he does not want it to be just a head, holding a small body in their hands. The guys note that he is smaller than expected, because his height is only two heads. Kai's eyes are shining, and he assumes that this is a warrior. At this moment, the creature opens its eyes and jumps out of the hero's hands, which scares him. The kid runs away, jumps up and says, Wasp. Kai is surprised how it sticks to his leg. Abbas says she is surprised by such a fruit, and Kai does not understand if it is normal to just be surprised. When the creature sticks to his leg, the hero asks to move away, and it obediently obeys the order. The main character argues that apparently this creature is also part of his ability, but it does not look like a warrior at all. To test this, Kai asks the kid to cultivate some earth and gives a child's hoe from Tenohira. But the creature goes to the usual hose, despite the warnings of the hero that they are heavy and instantly processes a large piece of land. The characters are surprised by the sight they saw. Abbas notes that this is a new workforce, he agrees with her. In the village, Kai tells Enel about it, and she assumes that it is the creation of a workforce. She argues that if the baby comes from the village, he should be as obedient as people and suggests using the baby to explore the lands, which inspires Kai. Kai tells Abbas about this, and she informs him that it is dangerous outside. However, he assures me that he knows about it. The demon offers his help to find meat or kill a monster that can be eaten. The main character refuses, as it is dangerous. The hero understands that what she feels is good, but he needs to find more resources. Abbas strokes his head until the main character realizes that he can't just rely on her. Kai asks the girl to teach him tricks that can be used on monsters to survive in the forest. However, Abbas, lowering his eyes, informs that this is a secret. Then the hero asks, based on the fact that he can retreat at any moment and the warrior will go with them. After thinking a little, Abbas agrees. The three of them go into the forest. Kai joyfully runs forward, saying that he will trust her. The warrior carries a hoe on his shoulder. The girl stops Kai, telling him not to go into dark places, 
as there are poisonous plants there. Then the hero decides to keep the warrior in the vanguard. They walk calmly through the forest while the warrior in front clears the way. The main character notes that he has not seen such plants before, and they are different from those in the kingdom of Lapilda. He turns to Abyss while she and the warrior have already brought him these plants. Kai calls her a child of nature, noting how her skin and hair shine. Along the way, they collected various plants and mushrooms, taking them to the village to the happy Abyss. The hero says that he does not see monsters, and Abyss replies that perhaps they do not know about his arrival. Monsters will attack if they see him because Kai looks delicious, this strains him, and the demon assures him that without a doubt the hero is appetizing. The hero says it's time to go back, at which point the warrior starts jumping. A huge snake appears behind Kai. Abyss quickly asks Kai to turn around, and he quickly moves to Tenohira's village. Enel, who was helping the residents, immediately noticed him. The hero remembers the size of the monster in fear, while the elf asks about the new harvest. Then he explains why he came. She clarifies about his condition. Kai says that everything is fine and is immediately horrified. Apologizing to Enel, the hero runs out of the village, mentally asking Abyss to be okay. Once in the outside world, the hero calls Abyss. A warrior sticks to his leg, and Kai is nervous about the abyss, not detecting the monster. She approaches him from behind, the hero asks about her, and she replies that the monster is gone, they're hugging. Kai apologizes for running away. However, Abyss says that everything is fine, and she is glad that he got out, because it would have been the end if he had died. The main character agrees with her, but blames himself for running away. He thinks the village is safe, but he doesn't know what's going on outside. After all, even if Abyss avoids monsters well, he won't stand it if she gets into a dangerous situation. He needs to think of other ways. On the way back, Kai thinks about the possibility of resisting monsters with the help of a warrior or a weapon, but for this you need to raise the level of the village and explore the island. Abyss holds him by the shoulder. The hero thinks that in this case stone tools will be useful. At this moment, a large shadow covers them. The girl throws the hero aside from the huge paw. They were attacked by a huge bird. Kai celebrates his luck. The abyss asks him to run and the monster screams at the hero while he is preparing a stone axe. Abyss asks Kai to run. The monster attacks him, but the warrior repels the attack. The bird staggers back and looks at the hero. Kai reasons that the monster is unlikely to leave after a repulsed attack. He does not feel the mind of a bird, but it will be difficult to escape from a flying enemy. The hero notices the feathers and comes up with something. He shouts at Abyss to go to the big tree first, since they have no choice but to fight. Kai orders the warrior to attack the legs with an axe, which the latter succeeds in doing. The monster turns towards the attacking opponents, and the demon asks why the hero does not run away. The main character assures her that everything will be fine and asks her to run away. He asks her not to worry, because if she runs away, they will follow her. Abyss agrees and runs away. When the hero sees this, he tells the warrior to hold out for a while and moves to the village. Enel is sitting and eating peacefully when Kai appears from behind and asks for fire. While the girl does not understand what is happening, the hero takes a potato sack, wraps it around a stick and dips it into the fire. Kai says to prepare more of these sticks. She asks what they are for and gets the answer, to destroy the monster. When the main character ran out of the village, Enel had already started making guns. Kai attacks the bird's feathers in the outside world. However, the monster shrugs off the hero. During a paw strike, Kai moves to the village, where Enel is waiting with a ready-made weapon. The warrior climbs a tree and attacks from the back. While Kai appears in front, he thinks that he will not escape anymore, because someone helped him. The warrior opened the bird's mouth with an axe. The hero strikes from the front, but the bird repels him. However, when Kai is about to transfer to the village, the monster's wing lights up. The monster tries to put it out, and the boy rejoices at the successful idea and praises the warrior. Abyss stands and looks towards the guys. Kai runs to the meeting with a warrior in his hands. He's interested in her escape. At this moment, a burning bird appears from behind. Kai takes Abyss by the hand and asks her to run, but she stands still and reasons that he was in danger. She lets go of his hand and walks forward, asking him not to hate her. In place of the little abyss, 
Her adult version with long hair appears, who calmly asks the monster to die and attacks him. The monster burns under the influence of a strong attack, and Kai is surprised by the sight he saw. This is the first time he sees such a thing, calling Abbas a sorceress, because the Lord of Magic, who releases incredible power from his body, unlike randomly given blessings, he recognizes the magical transformation in her face. Abbas is a little shy, but Kai supports her. The hero says that she is a sorceress. However, the girl says that despite the fact that she can use magic, she is not a sorceress. She asks you to accept her, whoever she is, and stay with her. The hero replies that he will never hate her and wants her to stay with him. Then the girl, after a short silence, admits that she is not human. Many years ago, a fighting doll was created, imitating the wizard Abbas who lived many years ago, who is immortal and lives off magic. Replicant Abbas is the girl's real name. However, the structure of her body is no different from the human body, neither externally nor internally. The hero clarifies the amount of time she spent on the island. The Abbas reports that it was created more than a thousand years ago, but woke up only 58 years ago. Kai notes a big age difference, and Abbas does not know why she woke up. Kai argues that, Despite the fact that she is a relic of the past, the fact that she is a replicant answers all questions. The hero smiles at her while she is surprised by the absence of his sadness. After all, she looks like a demon and is not real, just a human likeness. Then the main character takes her by the hand and thanks her for the revealed secret. He doesn't think it's bad, because Abbas is beautiful. She's embarrassed. The hero argues that Abbas saved his life. He will not leave it and no matter what happens, he is even ready to risk his life for Abbas. Besides, an android girl is a good reward. Kai asks about the master and Abbas says she can't live alone. She doesn't know how to live alone. So these days she has decided that Kai will be her master and offers to live together. The main character understands her feelings and asks why he is a master. The girl apologizes and, kneeling down, asks him to become her master again. The hero blushes and realizes that today he will give up the value of his past life. After all, without knowledge from a previous life, he would have stayed away from her and did not even understand what a replicant was. Kai argues that if Abyss starts to explore the world further, he will be able to find something to do. He agrees to her proposal and asks to be his forever. The girl agrees and asks to be taken care of. The hero thinks that until that day comes, let them live together. And he also thinks he's good at confessions. Abyss asks Kai what they are going to do next. Kai announces that he is going to take the monster to the village. Their attention is attracted by the warrior and shrinks in size. This greatly scares the hero, who thought that the last one was dead. He suggests asking Enel about it, and Abyss agrees with him. Kai transports himself and the remnants of the monster to the village, where he informs Enel about a big problem. She joyfully runs towards him and congratulates him on raising the level. The elf brings his sincere congratulations for getting the fifth level. The main character does not understand why. She says it's because he brought a bird whose meat and beak will be good materials. And there is also a new feature guests. Kai turns to Enel and clarifies. She confirms that he can now bring other people to the village. The elf explains that you need to hold hands when moving, and when he leaves, the guests are forced to leave after him. The hero decides to bring the abyss. However, he remembers the problem and shows the warrior who became the seed. She assures that everything is fine. The warrior just went into sleep mode due to injuries sustained in battle and will soon return to normal. The hero feels relieved. The main character apologizes for his reckless behavior, and Enel offers to invite Abyss and arrange a celebration in honor of the promotion to the fifth level. He decides that this is his chance to explain his abilities to Abyss. The girl is glad that the warrior will recover. The hero talks about the warrior and his uniform, rejoicing that he was not seriously injured. He says that the warrior is also part of his ability. Abyss notes that this is unusual. After all, as far as she knows, there was no no blessing a thousand years ago. Kai explains that God did not exist then either. Then Abyss asks if he brought a lot of things from the village. The hero responds positively and explains that the ability has been improved so he can bring a guest and offers to accompany him to the village. She enthusiastically agrees 
which leads Kai to conclude that she has never been off the island. He takes her hand, and they move. Houses are visible in the village. The main character explains that this is the village of Tenohira. Kai asks her how the village is and says it's amazing, but discovers a bent abyss. She holds her neck and asks about the magic power. The girl falls to her knees, and Enel, who has arrived, says that it is better for her to leave the village. After all, this is his world, and he is not a living world for everyone. The hero agrees with her words and says that he hopes that she will be alright, gently grabbing her arm, and they move again. And at that moment, Abbas came to life and straightened up which surprised Kai. He asks about her condition and gets a positive response, but she doesn't understand what happened. The girl says she was surprised, while the main character thinks that what surprised him was her. The abyss explains that it moves only because of magical power, but it is not actually there. She says she just can't move without magic power, but she's not dying, so she's fine. Kai suggests that it's something like radio waves. The main character, folding his arms, argues that he wanted to show her a lot, but it's too dangerous. Evening came and something very impressed the hero that he even had saliva. The hero saw a meat dish, and he is extremely delighted with its appearance. He explains to Adez that this is the meat of the monster they defeated, and Enel is responsible for its taste. It is seasoned with salt from seawater, and it is incredibly delicious. The main character bites off a piece of meat and trembles with the pleasure of the taste. Kai tearfully describes the taste of the dish, how the greasy taste spreads through the mouth. After all, he had tasted meat for a very long time. He asks the girl to try the dish, however, she refuses and says not to pay attention to her, since she will just look, because the master eats very tasty. Kai notes that thanks to Abbas, the dish becomes a hundred times tastier. After that, it's been like three months since the main character came to the island. The adult version of the abyss attacks the big boar and defeats it. She asks if the master is okay, holding his hand. He responds positively. A warrior stands next to them with a large stone axe on his shoulder. Then Kai asks what she saw on the south side. Abbas says that this island is shaped like a pumpkin and probably a large tree is located on the south side of the island. She says she thinks there is bitter fruit here. The hero asks what kind of fruit this is, while holding a hoe on which the warrior pulls himself up. Then the girl describes the fruit as something plump and green, pointing in the direction of something similar. The main character sees a sturdy and relatively squat tree, and coming closer, looking closely, jumps up, pulling one fruit from the tree. And when the hero sees the fruit, he recognizes the olive. Kai argues that if he can still get oil, he can make it. After all, he received little oil from hemp seed, so the hero suggests planting this plant. Kai asks for the warrior's help, and he digs up a tree. In the village and on the island, he began to grow tangerines and bananas. However, bananas are not that sweet, but they are small and edible. And water-repellent leaves have become a roofing material, they can also be used to transfer dishes. Tangerines have a strong sweetness and sourness, and also taste very good. Kai feels very rested when he eats this fruit, so maybe there are a lot of vitamins in it. The hero makes the assumption that, apparently, these fruits are not local, and, perhaps, these are improved species that were created by the civilization that created the abyss. Considering a small olive in its hands, she clarifies further actions. Then the main character reasons that he couldn't get enough of them to plant. Abbas says that everything he brings to the village will exist in it and the effect will be visible in the near future. Then Kai argues that if he brings a large number of fish and shells, he will be able to create an ocean. The girl stops and asks why the ocean. The hero explains that when creating the ocean, the culture of the village will develop and he will be able to build a boat when he thinks about escaping from the island. Abbas sadly repeats his words about escape. She clarifies what he is going to do after the escape. Kai says he wants to tell his family that he's fine, but also the main character reasons that the temple had eyes around them, so it would be impossible. However, he still wants to see them. The girl notes that her master has a family. Kai explains that they are his sister and father, turning to Abbas. He notices a slightly silent girl and, smiling, adds that if only she would go with him too. After all, Abus is also his family. The girl repeats the word family and, smiling gently, 
hugs the greatly embarrassed and blushing protagonist. There are arguments in his head that the civilization of a thousand years ago has too high a level of development. Kai, along with a smaller version of Abbas, return home. They are met by a warrior with two other small warriors. One of the little men bows to the heroes who have arrived. The girl notices that a little man also appeared from the third seed, and the hero notes that this is also a warrior. In the last three months, the main character has reached the seventh level, and he has two more creation seeds. The hero sits on a bench and argues that even if there is an ocean in the village of Tenohira, it will take quite a long time until they have a ship that can cross the ocean. He thinks it's terrible when there is no iron. When he was in Lapeld, he wanted to spend money. While Kai is saying out loud the fact that they need to get through the winter before that, the little warrior climbs onto the bench and touches his hand. When the main character turns his attention to him, three warriors are already standing on the bench and standing in a command stance. Kai praises the warriors and pats one of them on the head, saying that they are still holding up well, and he is counting on the little warriors. The hero notes to himself that he needs more of these warriors and needs to talk about it with Enel. In the village of Tenohara, the main character informs Enel that for some reason he would like more seeds and whether there is an opportunity to do something about it. The girl, eating a banana, says that it is unexpected and asks why it is so respectful. Then Kai replies that if it's difficult, then it's okay, which angers the elf. Looking sadly at Kai, Enel explains that the hero knows that she is just a manager and can't do anything about it. Then the main character tells her that he is going to rise a level higher, and that's not all. After all, right now the village needs livestock. To this, Enel argues that it will be good if they have a large workforce. She is thinking of five individuals who will be free to use this place. Kai is surprised by the number of necessary individuals. The girl replies that at least a couple will be needed, because it is difficult to tame if there are only one. The hero agrees with her. The main character thinks that he would like to have quiet wild animals on the island and decides to find out what is on the north side of the island. And so, having gathered, Kai informs Abbas of his intention to visit the northern part of the island, at the same time asking if she is okay. The girl responds positively. She says it's not too dangerous there while the little warriors are warming up. The hero enthusiastically suggests starting because their goal is animals that are likely to become livestock. The team with their hand up agrees. The guys move quickly through the forest and Kai asks how fast they will get to the northern part of the island. The girl replies that they are only halfway there. Abus asks if the main character is tired, to which he replies that he is not tired, since it is not difficult to run at this pace. The girl smiles happily and replies that it is not difficult for her either because it is always pleasant to spend time with the owner. The main character is again much embarrassed by the picture he saw, which causes Abbas to look at him questioningly. The team goes out into a field with sparse trees and small ponds. This place is just beyond the isthmus of the island. Kai notes that the atmosphere in this place is more peaceful than he imagined. Abbas explains that there are no monsters here because the magic power is more diffuse. He continues to argue that if they set up a base here, but the girl interrupts him and says that since there is no barrier of a large tree, the monsters will come here for Kai. The main character squats down and sighs that it would not be easy. The warriors look at him the same way. Kai gets up, but at that moment Abus stops him with an outstretched hand. The hero exclaims that she has found the herd. The hero notes that animals don't look like monsters. The girl agrees with him, because if they were monsters, they wouldn't be so lazy. The guys are hiding behind a tree. The abyss informs the hero about his unwell state of health due to the dissipated magical power. She feels a little powerless. Then the main character asks if she can use magic now. The girl replies that she can but not much. Kai says that then the stun will be more than enough and commands to attack. The abyss has already prepared an attack charge. The girl attacks a horned animal, which after hitting the attack falls to the ground. The animal next to it gets scared. After looking at the result a little, the hero asks if that thing is dead, to which Abus replies that he does not know, but it would not be difficult. Then the main character offers to check 
but the girl stops him, drawing his attention to the hostile bulls surrounding them. One of the animals starts attacking the guys at a run, so the girl covers Kai with herself and attacks the animal. She tells the main character to leave, and she will try to stun the animal somehow. Then the hero orders the little warriors to retreat, and they immediately react to his order. The girl fights off the attacks of the beasts, while the hero in the background, with three warriors in his hands, runs away. The enraged animal looks at the distressed abyss, who says that it is difficult for her to cast. She jumps up high and doing somersaults, strikes the animals in the air with a cry that it is a double flash. Abyss lands on the ground and Kai notices that things are not going well, as several more animals are running at her. She quickly notices them while the hero runs to meet her and shouts for the girl to hold her breath. Upon reaching her, the main character grabs Abyss by the hand and takes them to the village of Tenohara. As a result, the beast strikes the air. Having moved, Kai asks her to be patient a little more. He made the assumption that Abyss absorbs energy with her mouth, so if she holds her breath, it will be a little easier for her. The enraged animals, after standing and realizing that the enemies had disappeared, safely left. Then the main character moves himself and Abyss back. He says they did a good job until the girl can finally breathe. She draws Kai's attention to the lying animals that were stunned during the battle. The hero is very happy to find the cows and says that they will take them away. Abyss notes that it is good that they stunned them. Kai announces that he will reschedule them. Having moved the last bull to the village, he tells Enel about it. The same one, in turn, notices that they have one male and four females, and this is an excellent ratio. She congratulates the main character on completing the quest, and says that she may already be able to give him the seed of creation. The hero also notices that thanks to this, the ranch will be expanded. He, with a smile on his lips, thinks that soon they will give milk, and then there will be skin and meat, because you need to try your best and improve. After standing for a while and seeing the villagers with the bulls, Kai decides that he will also make every effort. The main character's first spring on this island, followed by a hot summer. Abus watches as Kai pulls the harvest in the garden with all his might, like the warriors, but he can't get it. Thanks for a good harvest. The abyss is attacking a big boar. The hero is cooking. The season is changing. A harsh winter has come. The main characters already have a large house with outbuildings nearby. Kai enters the house in warm clothes, where he is greeted in warm clothes by a girl with a warrior in her arms, while the second warrior greets him. Abyss asks how he likes the monster fur jacket. The hero responds with admiration that he really likes it, and in the confrontation with the cold, it cannot be compared with a hemp garment. The villagers of Tenohira tanned it using oil and vegetable extract. Kai thinks to himself that he knows how to tan leather piece by piece. However, it took him a while to finish it. He can't call it a luxury. A warrior approaches the main character and gives him a cup with a hot drink. Kai picks it up and rejoices at how warm it is. He thinks that thanks to the warriors, the smoke goes away unexpectedly quickly. As he thought, male strength is something, because they help them a lot. Kai also notes that cold nights are very dangerous and they are not tolerated even by the monster's fur, drinking a drink from a mug. The hero begins to doubt the possibility of surviving the winter on this island. However, noticing how Kai's hands are shaking, Abyss clings to him. This confuses the main character. He looks at her and thanks her for being with him. She replies with a smile that she is very pleased with him, and it is good that he survived. The guys are all hugging together, sitting around the campfire. Clear skies and people living in a fairly developed village. Enel runs next to a field where a man is plowing. She looks up and smiles, holding a bowl in her hands. She says that spring is coming soon. The village sign says, Cultural rank Stone Age. The next level is to gain a hundred people. Kai draws on the blackboard with a knife. With a smile, he notices that the year has passed faster than expected, and looks at the crossed out sticks. The hero moves to the village of Tenohara with a backpack on his shoulders. Someone is running towards him, screaming. And this someone turns out to be Enel, who congratulates him on moving to the tenth level. Kai is pleasantly surprised. The main character looks at the sign and, after reading the new features, asks about some kind of tree warehouse. The elf replies that this is a new feature. Enel explains that now the village has exits to all sides of the world. This means that no matter where Kai comes from, 
and from which side he comes, he will always return to the point where the ability is activated. That is, if he places the warehouse in the real world, then it will be connected to the village. Holding a wooden pillar in his hands, the hero joyfully calls it a warp point. After all, even if it is in the middle of the ocean, you can move to the island through the village of Tenohara. The elf girl also hands the main character the seed of creation, which the hero calmly accepts. In the real world, he buries the seed in the garden and thinks that he will plant it in the best field so that things go faster, and also decides to choose another profession instead of a warrior next time. A few days later, two sharp ears were sticking out of the ground. Abbas and Kai look at each other in disbelief and discuss what to do. The girl bravely and enthusiastically offers to harvest. The main character notes that this is brave. Starting to dig, they discover long hair and are surprised to find a girl's head. She abruptly opens her eyes and jumps out of the ground, which frankly surprises the hero. The girl gets into a cute pose and says that she was born and jumped out, humming a melody, the great magician of Hellfire. After all, she is just a bomb and is a Yorushikyun, addressing Kai my lord. She continues to stand in a cute pose while the characters silently watch her and the main character utters something like joy. This is a 10th level reward. A golden seed that gave birth to a great wizard. Kai notes that a Japanese-style girl with fox ears is really unexpected. The girl was shaking herself off the ground at this time. She approached the main character and, drawing attention to herself, asked for a cute name for herself. He is a little embarrassed, realizing that it is not Watashi. The girl emotionally says that Watashi is the first person he knows. Kai thinks about a cute name for a girl. He remembers that his name Kai is similar to L in Japanese, which is why he thought for a long time that his name was L. The hero thinks for a while and suggests the name Ren. The girl stops and says the name out loud. Ren asks if this is her name and Kai confirms her words. At the same time introducing himself and Abbas, Ren repeats the names of new friends and rushes to hug them, which embarrasses Abbas and Kai, asking them to take care of her. Kai's family has grown and life has become more stable. The guys are attacked by a formidable lion and Ren says to leave everything to her as the wizard of Hellfire. She folds her fingers in a bizarre shape and exhales the flame. Controlling the flame, a satisfied Ren delivers a crushing blow to the lion. This greatly surprises Abus and Kai. He asks Abus if it's magic, to which the girl replies that it's not magic, and even if there is magic, she doesn't know about it. The hero is surprised by this turn, then Abus explains that magic is performed using mana in the air, but Ren does not use the mana of this world. Abus doesn't understand what it is. The main character compares the power of Ren with the village and thinks about whether it is a force that deviates from the law of this world. It is a mystery to him. At this moment, Ren turns turns to him, asking how he is and claiming that he will not let him freeze. Kai confirms that he does not like the cold. Thanks to Abus and Ren, most of the dangerous monsters were hunted down. The hero thinks that he cannot say that there is a surplus in the ecosystem and he will use it as material with a sense of gratitude. He's sitting in front of a dead boar. In the village of Tenohara, which has been transformed into an agricultural village, the sea has finally appeared. A joyful Enel approaches the main character and asks to look at the seafood that has finally appeared in the village. In her hands is a basket filled with various seafood. She reports that the ship has not yet been commissioned and, as expected, only a simple collection can be made on the coast. Kai thinks about it and, turning around, asks Enel to prepare a hemp rope and a light but strong log. This request surprises her. The hero, turning to her, explains that he can no longer wait and they will continue the escape plan. The little three warriors are building a ship from all sides. Abyss asks Kai if he can build a ship. Then he answers, yes, and says that he has tried it many times. If they can achieve buoyancy and stability, then they can make an orthodox squid-shaped raft. She notes that the main character is indeed leaving the island, to which Kai responds positively, because he can't stay here forever, and he also wants to show her the outside world. After a short silence, Abyss turns to the hero. But at this moment a joyful Ren shouts that everything is complete, and Kai offers Abbas to sail. She sighs heavily. The day before departure, someone explains that if this is a thousand-year-old map, then there is land in the southwest, drawing on the ground 
wind with a stick. Ren says that the sail moves with the help of Abus wind magic. Abus replies that even so it will still take 11 days. She also says that she only knows the area of the past, and she does not know where the city is. Kai nods his head and says that this is enough. The guys argue that even if they can't find a place to live, they just have to go from one place to another. The main character informs that he will put a stake under a large tree in order to return in an emergency. He continues that the ration will last for 10 days. However, at this moment, the abyss raises its head and, standing up, walks away in the direction of the sea. Then Kai asks what happened. The girl turns her head and says worriedly that the ship is already here. This makes the main character start to get nervous. They go ashore and see a large ship, which is pointed out by the abyss. The hero immediately recognizes the temple ship in it, being in a bad mood. Kai abruptly turns around and orders the warrior to hide the raft behind a large tree. The kid reacts instantly. The hero argues that it cannot be that they came to save him. Abus, who stands behind him, argues that the ship arrived only during the spring, that is, the same as when Kai. He remembers the events of the past. The girl asks what the main character is going to do. He remains silent, and Abus continues that he knows he can't wait to leave the island. She wanted to say more, but the hand on her head that Kai puts stops her. The hero, smiling, says that he will help. Walking down to the shore, the main character tells Abbas and Ray to be ready and he will go alone. Going down to the shore, Kai hides behind trees and rocks in order to remain unnoticed. Suddenly he notices someone. The hero sees an inquisitor in a dark robe and a little girl with toys in her hands coming down from the ship. She falls and, turning to the inquisitor, grabs his clothes on her knees. The inquisitor waved her away with his hand and because of this, the girl falls down along with the toys. The picture he saw strongly causes Kai a strong rage. He mentally holds himself in place while the girl is already lying on the dock. The ship sailed away, and the girl was getting up. But when she saw that the ship had already sailed far away, she lay down on the pier again and began to shake. She starts to rise, and at that moment the main character approaches her. He greets her and thanks her for the journey she has made. The girl, perplexed, asks where she is and who the hero is. Calling him an older brother, Kai informs her that he will tell her about it later. She cries and asks again what she should do now. Clutching the bunny toy to her, the hero replies that she will live on this island for the time being. Then the girl asks if they can return home. Kai, leaning towards the water for the fallen toy, begins to answer, but the pole he was holding on to broke and Kai fell into the water. The girl looks at Kai, who got her a fallen toy in the form of a cat. The main character smiles at her and says that it is impossible to return home yet, but he will definitely come up with something. At this moment, an enraged Ren runs to them at high speed, on which a calm abyss hangs. Ren turns to Kai, but he interrupts her and says that he told her to wait. Abyss smiles softly, continuing to hold Ray. At the same time, Ray furiously shouts that she was watching and asks what kind of artificial friend it is and offers to roast it whole. Kai gently says that it is not necessary, otherwise she will have to leave this place. Abyss turns to the main character, releasing Ren. Kai then informs her that the escape from the island will be postponed for the time being. The girl clarifies what he is going to do. Ren is chatting sweetly with the girl at this time. The hero seriously continues to say that as long as Farley's religion abandons children on this island, he will save them and not let them die. Abbas smiles gently at the main character and replies that this is what she expected from him. She thought he would say so. Kai is also smiling, and Ray is stroking the surprised girl's head in the background. The guys are walking through the forest and Ray asks the girl, who is carrying on her back, that she came from a city with a large castle called Godi. The baby answers affirmatively while Abbas dries the toy and Kai, who argues that he does not know this city. The hero argues that the temple is a huge global organization and this island may have been a children's dump for all countries. The abyss dries the main character. Kai asks the girl if she is in the middle of the blessing ceremony, 
calling her keyed. He tells her that her seal shape was the same as his and offers to hold a blessing ceremony later. Keed, stumbling a little, sadly says that she has received the power of an evil god and asks if this is the norm. The main character smilingly replies that it is thanks to this power of the evil god that he lives on this island. The girl is surprised. He goes on to say that not all the teachings about Farism are true and even on the contrary. It does not seem that they are all the same. Kai gives Keed the dried toy and clarifies that isn't it up to her to decide how to use her blessing. After all, she can decide for herself what she wants to do. The guys come to the house. Keed is surprised to see the warriors who greet the guys. The girl squats down and asks about the warriors one of whom waves cheerfully at her. Kai explains that this was part of the blessing, and he looks pretty strong as he picks up the hoe. Putting the hoe on his shoulder, the main character offers to work in the field that they plan to leave. Keed is watching him. She asks Kai if he feels lonely while he is already digging up the ground with a hoe. Abbas approaches Keed and says that he thinks he is lonely because he has a family that he wants to meet. When he came to this island, he sometimes looked at the ocean. Abbas keeps saying that, however, even if he waits, he won't be picked up, and she thinks he's doing his best in front of them. Abus and Keed are watching Kai at work. The girl looks at her toys and thinks about her father and mother. She furrows her brows a little. Keed is sitting on a wooden chair. Kai is standing in front of her, and Ray and Abbas are next to her. Kai is dressed in church clothes. Ray sarcastically asks what the main character is wearing, and he replies that this happens once in a lifetime. He cheerfully addresses Keed and reminds her of the name of the god he taught her. The girl is worried. She takes a deep breath and, clasping her hands together, pronounces the name of the god Alamir. The light is sparkling around her, and Keed is surprised by this. She asks the hero if she can try, and he calmly agrees. Then the girl turns to her toys and stretches her arms forward. Keed says the words temporary life and her toys come to life before her eyes, which surprises Kai. The toys greet Keed and ask if she is okay. Abbas notes that the toys were moving, and the hero adds that they were also talking. Keed and Ray are enthusiastically watching the animated toys together. The main character thinks that the blessing ability should be the same from each god, but the same blessing of Alamira gave him another other ability, and it is truly mysterious. The girl turns to the thoughtful hero and enthusiastically says that Keed will help him with his work. Kai doesn't mind and replies that he is counting on her. And then they spent three months together until Keed got used to this kind of life. The guys worked together and the four of them slept in the same bed. They ate together. Keed smiles at them. The weather was clear at the beginning of summer. And since the safety of the raft is not guaranteed, Kai asked Ray and Keed to look after the house which Ray was not happy about, and Keed waved her hand after them. To obtain materials that are not available on the island, Kai and Abbas went to the ocean in search of a city that the hero has not yet seen. In front of the guys there was an open, clean and large sea. The guy said that it did not matter in which direction he was heading, because all he could see was only a distant and boundless horizon line. Ibis was standing on the edge of a small boat. She was looking at the horizon when she said that without her navigation skills, their escape from the island would have been simply unthinkable. Kai was wiping his sweat when suddenly a large stream of water from the sea burst out. The guy was scared enough and clung to the ship. He took a deep breath and said it was a good thing they didn't take Keed with them. Abyss looked worried. A little earlier, before Kai and the others set off, Ren was cursing loudly on the island not understanding at all how a cutie like her should even keep an eye on the house. She resentfully shouted that she would not stay for anything, and would sail with them. Kai looked at her and sighed, saying that he had already told her about everything earlier. He looked at the boat and said that this raft simply could not withstand four passengers, and he did not even know what dangers could await them on the way. He said that Ibis has a map of the island and she has wind magic. He also added that the only one who can take care of Kida is Ren. In response to this, the girl had nothing to say. In the end, Ren still stayed on the island with Keed. While one of them was watering the garden, Ren walked beside her and smiled sweetly. She walked up to Kida and exclaimed loudly, inviting the girl to play. Keed, who was quite responsible, said that now was not the time, 
because first of all it was necessary to finish the work. Ren was upset and asked if Kai had not left them food, because she definitely remembers it. He left them tons of potatoes, smoked meat and a fishing net. Keed looked away and said that despite this, the fields still need care. She recalled that her brother had previously said that they should not rely on the village of Tenohira. The little creatures were hovering around Ren and repeating what Keed had said. They said she didn't have to worry, and they could play later. Little Keed was spinning from side to side, telling others what to do. She asked Gomo and Mira to collect the beans, and Ren and the others to bring some water. Ren was absent-mindedly sitting by the stream and talking about how she was very bored. She asked others to look at a poor thing like her. She just wanted to have fun since she was born. At this time, the little creatures were hurrying the girl. Ren agreed and said that she knows that she needs to take care of this island. She looked at the small tower of stones that she had made herself and doubted. She thought about Kida and realized that for many reasons she just couldn't do it. She lifted the water back up and sighed. She turned to my lord in her mind, asking him when he would finally return. Her ears pricked up, and she confidently stood up and looked at the sky illuminated by sunlight. Suddenly one of the little creatures fell. Keed helped him up, and said that she had already guessed that the effect of her ability might be over. Suddenly, she heard someone's invited screams. She turned and began to look around, trying to figure out what kind of sound it was. She tensed, remembering that quite dangerous monsters used to live on this island. However, the guys said that they had already exterminated everyone. She was thinking that there shouldn't be a single living monster around them. At that time, a small broken egg was lying on the outskirts of the island. Keed slowly turned back, noticing a large shadow above her. As soon as she turned around, the girl turned very pale and there was horror on her face. She immediately tried to run away. She hugged her toy and ran away in tears while a huge bird-shaped monster tried to eat her. At that moment, she only wanted to see her brother. At the same time, Ibis used air magic to move their raft. Kai exclaimed that they had finally managed to escape from the ocean current. He smiled at Ibis and said that her magic was really amazing. He said that now he can rest too. Ibis smiled and said that this was all she was capable of. She stated that she was just, but considering that she was not so strong in battle, she uses magic in this way in everyday life. She decided to give an example, saying that Ren is much stronger in combat power than she is. Kai looked away and laughed a little awkwardly. At this time, little Keed was mentally begging for mercy and trying to cover herself with her hands so as not to die. Suddenly, Ren appeared there, who hit the monster trying to eat the girl with all her might. With incredible strength and speed, the monster flew into one of the trees, leaving many cracks in its wake. Ren quickly got close to him and kicked him, thereby driving him deep underground. She took a deep breath then looked at Keed with a wide smile and asked if the girl was okay. She exclaimed that the great hellfire mage had just arrived. After seeing Ren, Keed burst into tears hugging her toy. She ran up to the fox and hugged her. Ren began to comfort the girl, saying that she would always be with her. Ren carried the girl on her back. Keed awkwardly looked away and said that she was riding on a girl's back this way for the first time. Ren laughed sweetly when she heard that. Keed bent her head and apologized for not putting in enough effort. She awkwardly said that she thought her brother would not come back. At that moment, Ren froze. She was terrified by the thought that my lord might not return. She was terrified at the thought that she would never see him again. She collapsed to the ground, which surprised Keed. The girl asked Ren what happened. The fox hesitated then said that the fact was that she was very lonely. Large drops of tears appeared in her eyes. She said she didn't want to even think about it at all. The girl burst into loud tears, clinging to the ground. Keed was confused. The girl came closer to Ren and apologized, because she said a little wrong. She hugged the fox and said that everything would be fine now. She said it was only natural that Kai would come back. They hugged tightly when Keed suggested that the fox wait for her brother together. In response, Ren just continued to cry. 
the little creatures watched from the sidelines. And so it was a deep and dark night. While the fox was lying under the blanket, little Keed turned to her and asked if she had heard this strange noise. The girl opened the door of their cottage and looked at the field. There, she was able to see several small creatures also emerge from the ground. A sleepy wren came out to Kida. Together, they stared at what was happening in amazement. The girl asked in disbelief if this was some kind of strange ritual. Wren smiled broadly and said that there was nothing to worry about because it was something like vegetative reproduction. Keed was surprised to hear about this. The girl could only guess what these creatures were. Wren reassured her and said that Keed would see it herself very soon, because there were only a couple of days left to wait. Everything happened exactly as Wren said. After only a few days, which Keed stubbornly tended the garden, the little creatures one by one rose from the ground. With a smile on her face, Wren explained that the time my lord allowed the little warriors to reproduce, they began to plant seeds. That's how this process goes. Keed wondered if they had really planted them. The little warrior walked up to Keeda and started talking to her. The surprised girl looked at Wren, wanting to know what the little warrior had told her. The girl only blushed a little and looked away. Wren awkwardly said that since there were so many of them, she no longer feels so lonely. That's all she was trying to say earlier. Keed looked at the little warrior who was standing in front of her. She hugged him tightly and thanked him for telling her about it. She was thinking about her brother, saying that they would definitely wait for him, safe and sound. At that time, the raft on which the guys were moving was close to some shore. Kai exclaimed that he saw something. He called Ebis, saying that there was land there. The girl came closer and said that this land is the same as on the topographic map. Kai was pulling himself up because his body was very numb from such a long trip. Kai noticed that if he teleported to Tenohira's village now, then the moment he returned, the coordinates would change and he would just fall into the sea. He looked around and told Ibis that they should dock at the shore first. After a while, they stopped at the shore and tied the raft to the trees. Kai dusted off his hands and asked Ibis if there was a big river nearby. He said that there is usually a city nearby. The girl said they should look after it. She held out her hand and said that he was in that direction. The girl noted that it will take about three days if you walk. Kai wasn't too upset about the three-day walk because it's still better than staying on a raft. He also pointed out that they couldn't keep Keed and the others waiting for them for so long. He said they had to get to the city quickly, and that was a must. He smiled at Ebis and asked if everything was okay. After that, he said they should hurry up a bit. The girl agreed with him, after which they set off together. Two days later, the guys were on the continent, passing by some kind of sign, Kai said that they would come to the city very soon. He turned to Ebis, then asked if she would be able to transform into her adult form. The girl agreed. She closed her eyes and concentrated, after which she really became a few years older. Kai said that it was good, after which he asked the little warriors to gather around him. He took the warriors by the head, after which he said Tenohira syllables. Ebis was standing and watching this at the time. After a while, the boy returned to her, he was wearing different clothes, and there was a fairly large wagon behind him. Kai reported that he had left warriors to guard the village. He said that with this, they would be able to transport food from there to the city by wagon. He was driving a cart with tomatoes, tangerines, bananas, beans and sea salt on a pair of domestic buffaloes. Ibis noticed that her master looked a little different today. Kai laughed, after which he said that he had slightly improved his outfit for this occasion. He said the clothes were a little tight, but it was much better than his old hemp clothes. He proudly exclaimed that he was a great merchant, and Ebis was his personal guard. He said they should stick to that particular story. After that, he handed Ebis a small cape and told her to cover her horns with it. The girl obediently put on the cape. The cap of this garment was somewhat unusual. Covering Ebis's horns, she resembled a cat's ears. The girl gently touched these ears, then stood on her toes and turned from side to side, after which she asked Kai how it was for him. The boy gave a thumbs up and said it was devilishly beautiful. After that, they got into a small wagon together, and Kai shouted to the buffaloes to go ahead. They drove at a slow pace along small village roads, 
Abruptly, Ibis froze. She turned to the side and told the owner that she was hearing human voices. Kai asked where she had heard them. The girl pointed to the bushes that were not so far away. Kai stated that if they were local, they could learn more about the area from them. She asked if he wanted to check it out, which the guy undoubtedly agreed with. Together they got off the wagon and walked towards the muffled voices. Several people shouted that she was here and they should catch her. A small girl, bound by the legs, fell painfully to the ground with a scream. Several bandits surrounded her from all sides. With creepy grins, they said that this was how their game of hide and seek ended. One of them grabbed the girl by the hair and declared that he would not let her escape again. Another bandit stopped a friend and told him not to be so rude with their goods. The girl looked at them with intense malice. Five people were standing next to this girl. Kai and Ebis were watching all this. The girl asked Kai what he wanted to do. The guy wondered if he should stop them, because it really looked just disgusting. The guy said he would think about it later. He quickly turned to Ebis and said that these guys looked much weaker than their buffaloes, so she could join the fight. The girl slowly raised her hand and agreed. In the blink of an eye, one of the bandits was shaking terribly as he screamed loudly. The others were very surprised to notice this behavior. Following him, the others fell into the same state. One by one, they fell to the ground unconscious. The startled girl did not understand at all what had happened. She only assumed that it was magic. Kai came out of the bushes, who anxiously asked the girl if she was okay. The guy slowly approached the girl and apologized, saying that it seemed to him that the danger was too high. He asked if he had disturbed them. The girl said that this was not the case, and then thanked him. She looked at him in some doubt and remembered the recent attack she had seen. She asked if he was a magician. Kai said that this was not the case. He said with a smile that he was a merchant who was opening a business in the city, and his name was Kai. The guy reported that the magic she had seen earlier belonged to his guard. He suddenly asked if she could tell them her name. The girl hesitated after learning that he was a simple merchant. The girl said with a heavy smile that her name was Sarah Bianchi. She said that's exactly what they see. Kai didn't understand what she was talking about at all. He asked what he was seeing. The girl closed her eyes and said that he was a merchant, and obviously he should understand. She stated that she even likes the fact that he turns a blind eye to it. She looked at him and asked what else. Sarah said the seller wouldn't do anything unless he got something in return. Kai was very surprised and delighted. He came closer to the girl and asked if she really wanted to help them. He asked if she would take them to the city. Sarah was a little surprised by this. She asked if that was enough for them. Kai exclaimed that everything was fine, because it would be just wonderful if she told them about the local information, and also helped during his trade. The girl looked away. She assumed he was talking about the Osprey. She asked him to give her some time to think. Kai agreed with this, when suddenly a realization came to him. The girl thought that it was just a pure accident that she was able to get out of the city earlier, and it would also be nice to take him there. Kai exclaimed nervously that if she couldn't do without it, then she should forget what he said. He stated that an approximate direction and general information would be quite enough. The girl said she fully understood his concern. Sarah smiled and said that she would accompany them to the center, because the sense of justice in her heart simply would not allow her to reject this request. Kai gasped a little in surprise, then thanked the girl, he said she should only do it if it didn't make her uncomfortable. She sighed loudly. Sarah confessed that she was on the run with those who could not be trusted at all. It was just a quick deal in this city. She assumed that it was probably fate that foreshadowed their meeting. Hearing this, Kai looked at her with some tension. Suddenly the girl added, asking if he had a scarf, and if he had, could he borrow the thing? The guy had it, so he gladly gave Sarah this thing. The girl carefully wrapped the scarf around the accessory that was around her neck. Kai didn't understand at all why she was wearing a collar. The guy asked who these people were who had caught her. Sarah said that this is the personal army of the trading company. She said that the ruffians are very experienced in intimidation and harassment. Kai said that everything was fine now. He quickly approached one of the bandits and began to examine them. Sarah was surprised. Kai was pulling things out of their jackets. Picking up one coin, he noticed that he was seeing them for the first time. 
he also took the man's boots, leather gloves, and a long sword. Together with Ebis, they sorted out the bandits' belongings. Kai thought that their models are quite thoughtful, because they are much better than those from the island or village. He thought that they should be taken with him to the village of Tenahira. Suddenly, he noticed Sarah's startled look. He smiled awkwardly and said that if he did so, they would not be able to follow their trail immediately. They tied the bandits to trees and left them there. When they returned to the carriage, Kai asked if such a disgusting attitude was always in this area. The girl said that this was not the case, and these places were the last annexed possessions of the Lamelik Empire. According to the stories of the mercenaries, entire districts were destroyed in the trading city. On the way, Kai asked if this was a port city. He was amazed to notice such a large place. Scorpa has been a thriving port city since ancient times. Sarah asked where he would like to start. The guy exclaimed that he had already decided. He said they needed to eat and refresh themselves first. They went into a small shop where they got something to eat. The guy genuinely enjoyed the meal. Sarah was somewhat surprised. Kai was glad that he would finally be able to enjoy food not only from Tenohira, he returned to human civilization. Ibis was eating an apple when her gaze caught on something. The girl was looking at street musicians for the first time. Kai was in another country for the first time because he had never had the opportunity to travel in his previous life. It made him think of his sister. He thought that he couldn't use his abilities on such a crowded avenue. At least he wanted to buy supplies and return home after. After the purchase, he apologized for the wait and said to start with the food department. The prices looked decent. He asked Sarah what she would do after that. The girl hesitated. She asked if he would mind if she stayed with them. Kai didn't mind, because he was even glad that someone familiar with the city would be around. The girl asked if he really didn't know the meaning of her collar. Kai asked if it wasn't just an ornament. Sarah laughed. She had the feeling that he came from high society. She said that's what they put around the servants' necks. This blocks the wizard's ability while the master decides what will happen to him next. And as soon as the owner makes a decision, he removes the emotions of the owner and makes him obedient. It's something like a magic collar seal. After hearing this, Kai understood everything. Sarah said that she used to be a sorceress but now she is a runaway servant. Kai thought that magic in this world is transmitted through the bloodline. In simple words, these are aristocrats. As soon as emotions are removed, the master receives magical power from the bloodline of the newly minted servant. Thus, such a magician is sold at an inflated price, and now everyone is fiercely looking for her. Kai thought that this world was much more dangerous than he thought. Sarah apologized for not mentioning it, she assumed that Kai came from such houses, which usually have such people. She also noticed that the guy's companion is very quiet. Sarah said she wouldn't be surprised if Ebis's emotions had already disappeared. The girl stated that she did not need a collar to follow the owner. Kai asked if Sarah could take off the collar. The girl did not know how to do this because he is indestructible. She didn't know for sure, but it was made by a blessed man. Kai was surprised. He thought that the temple was doing terrible things. He wouldn't be surprised if it was the same group that expels children. He sighed and invited Sarah to go with them on the raft he arrived on. She asked if it was true. Kai said they couldn't leave the people they helped. They will find a way to remove the collar. Sarah was grateful. She thought that she no longer had time to talk about anything or ask for help from a guy. She wanted to say something, but Kai quickly called her over. He picked up the escort's spare clothes and said she needed to change a little. She put it on and was very embarrassed. Kai asked her to clench her fists, which made her blush even more. People crowded around and offered different amounts of money that they had. They wanted to take this particular product. They had never seen such good bulls here before. They noticed that even surrounded by these people, he was calm. His fruits were sweet and delicious. Ibis was more or less calm while Sarah was blushing because there were too many people. She asked if they had done too well. Kai didn't expect this either. And so the night came. The guys were at the tavern. They were amazed by the amount of money raised. Ibis said there were a lot of sequins. Kai admired that it was incredible. Sarah said that this amount is enough to buy a second-rate palace. Kai wanted to raise the price a bit 
but the demand for them is huge. Those bowls and fruits were curiosities from a desert island for them. And for those who grew up in Tenoria, they are just garbage found here and there. Ibis asked the owner what they would buy with the money. The guy said they would stock up on iron. First, then, depending on prices, chickens, horses and pigs, they will also need a shepherd dog. Then they will take grain and wool. In addition to materials, they will also need knowledge. For example, how to make alcohol and soap. General knowledge about skin treatment. Kai also wanted to learn more about how to grow olives. He was wondering how Keed and the others were doing. After the shopping trip, they will go home. The guy asked Sarah if she agreed with the plan. He said that while they were shopping, she could wait for them at the tavern. If she has nowhere to go after that, she can hide with them, even if it is a desert island. The girl hesitated. She asked if she could keep her identity private. Kai took a bag of something and said that she didn't ask questions either. He handed her the bag and said it wasn't much, but if she wanted a drink before going to bed, she should take it. She grabbed his hand and looked into his eyes. Kai blushed. She said he had beautiful, innocent eyes. She decided to tell him her story. Sarah was hoping for his attention. He agreed. As Kai had guessed, she came from a noble family. Since he is a merchant, he must have heard about the principality of Mondial. The guy got nervous because he doesn't know anything. He said he knew that. She said that she was the court magician of this principality. It all happened the other day before Mondial fell to the onslaught of the Lamelicht Empire. They, the third detachment of the royal guard, accompanied the princess to a neighboring country, but they were surrounded on the way. It was two brothers and their army. They said they would tell the boss the good news. The magicians asked if these people were from the regular army. They weren't going to lose to the bandits. The man grinned and used magic. Sarah was surprised. The man attacked them. Sarah broke up with him, and they had a clash. The man said that the situation was bad. Sarah's magic was dispelled. The man hit her. At this time, his brother caught the princess. Sarah cried out for him to let her go. He told her to give up. They caught everyone and told them to behave normally from now on. They have become a commodity. After that, Sarah was bought first. On the way to the deal, she managed to escape, and she bumped into the guys. That's how it was. She fell to her knees and asked Kai to save Princess Uriso. Kai was surprised. Sarah understood that she was greedy, but she saw that Kai was a powerful merchant. Kai stopped her. Saving the princess is not something that one merchant can do. This would be the case if the princess was caught by the imperial army. But the ones who captured them were the mercenaries hired by the merchants. They don't choose buyers. Kai asked what amount it might take to redeem the princess. The girl said that it leads to this. She told him to sell it to another merchant. She's a magician and since she's offering it herself, he should do it. She can be sold at a higher price than the princess. She hoped that Kai would use this money to help out the princess and her friends. The guy asked about a higher price than for the princess. Sarah said that children born to sorceresses always have magical potential. If such a child is adopted by the nobles, then he will receive a status. Without a doubt, this is what many millionaires dream of. She didn't quite understand if merchants exchanged information among themselves. But since there was such a marketable product, the rules could be ignored for profit. Kai thought it made sense. He asked Sarah what she would do if he sold her and ran away with the money. The girl froze. She asked why he would do that. He wouldn't have done that, but he decided to ask. Sarah screamed at him not to scare her like that anymore. Kai understood what it means to be sold for the first time. She's too trusting of someone she sees for the first time. The girl asked what was wrong with his appearance. She didn't even think about it, because she believed in him. The thought had never crossed her mind. Kai thought she was very honest. This naive girl was easily deceived and thrown away. Kai thought that nothing connected them. He had a lot of help in this world, so he couldn't do that. He agreed, but with two conditions. The first was that she had to trust him completely. She said she would always believe him. Then there was the second condition. He asked Ibis to take off her cloak. The girl asked if everything would be okay. She did as he asked. Sarah saw the horns of Ibis. She was surprised and asked if Ibis was a demon. Kai said that's not the case. It was a risky move. 
People in this world believe that they are close to God. However, there are demons in mythology. Everyone is afraid of them, both children and adults. If Sarah makes too much fuss about Ebus's appearance, then nothing will work. The girl hesitated and said that she did not know all the details, but it could not be that such a beautiful girl was a demon. Kai was glad that she wasn't surprised, because Ebus was important to him. The girl blushed. She called the guy to sleep. Kai said that his own is also worth sleeping, and that's enough for today. She was surprised and asked if the guy was really going to save her. Kai agreed. He has already decided, so he will definitely do it. Ebus called him to sleep soon. He asked where she was going in a hurry. The girl said that she had a fever all over her body for some reason. But she has a feeling that she will sleep with the owner and everything will pass. Kai was amazed to understand the girl's intentions. He fell down and asked her to wait. The girl asked in frustration if he didn't like it. He asked how he might not like it. He said he was about to turn 14, so he couldn't tell her. He didn't understand what he was doing by refusing her. He asked her to forget. She beamed, and then went to bed with him in a good mood. Sarah blushed and said that since she should become a servant soon anyway, she didn't mind either. The three of them lay down. Kai didn't know how to sleep. He decided he should stop thinking. Suddenly, Sarah said that this was the last night she could relax. It wasn't for long, but she was grateful. He asked if she was afraid of being betrayed. The girl was ready, and she was more worried that the princess had become a servant and was suffering. Princess Yuri is like a younger sister to her. He and Kai are about the same age, and they should become friends. Sarah will be calm if he looks after her. He thought that Sarah was very simple-minded and too honest, a naturally kind person who doesn't even doubt. He wanted to save such people. As Kai thought, no one sells ore at the bazaar. He asked Sarah how ore was mined in her country. The girl didn't know much about such things. Kai said that first you need to buy tools. Before saving the princess, Kai needed to buy something. Sarah was wondering if she could trust him. The guy said that if Ebus wanted something, then she needed to say it. Slowly but surely, the guys were engaged in trading, so they sold the last item. The animals turned out to be 80% larger than he expected. He wanted to buy horses and pigs, but the horses were too expensive, and there were no pigs. Iron tools, grain and vegetables, wool and bags, earth sugar. They also managed to get soap and aromatic oils. When Ebus said how much they took, Kai said that it was still not enough. He said he was going to pack. Kai asked Sarah to wait there, because he would be back soon. The girl stood and waited. Kai thought this place would do. He asked Ibis to wait and said Tenohira again. Enel asked how it went and if he had got the resources. Noticing all this, she fainted. It was the first time he had brought so much. He left the girl and decided that she would sort everything out when she woke up. There's still a little bit to go to the next level. Sarah was sitting alone. Kai in a mask came up and asked how she was. The girl asked what kind of mask it was. It was a disguise. She thought he wasn't coming back. She apologized for becoming so helpless alone. The one who should be with her is someone else. She's usually not that weak. She got up and said they should go. The guy asked to take him to the trading company where the princess is located. After he sells her, he won't be able to save the princess if he knows her location. Sarah agreed. She said that Yuri herself is in the building of the Malini company. They combed her hair there. Someone came in and greeted her. The man told her not to worry because they know how to handle the goods. You need to be careful with such a high-end product. However, there is no guarantee that if someone else had picked her up, they would have treated her the same way. He said that her sorceress would not return. He asked if she was sure she didn't know where she might have gone. The princess was silent. The man said that other merchants, the imperial army, or bandits. It doesn't matter who grabbed her, she's in trouble. He told the princess that there was no point in thinking about running, because she could only live in a gilded cage. The girl screamed, creating a barrier around her. He noticed that this was the power of the princess's blessing. He asked how long she would be sitting there. He ordered her to stop her senseless resistance. Because of her silence, he started shouting for her to come out. Someone said it was rude. 
Fossil was standing in the doorway. He said about the indecent scene. The boss told Fossil to do something to her. The man said that this was impossible because he could not be penetrated by either a physical or magical attack. Fossil told the boss not to worry because she would not escape from the barrier. The man noticed that it was said by the man who had missed the sorceress. He said he was paying a lot of money. Capturing Yuri and the sorceress during the war would have been a great achievement, but he did not plan to forgive this oversight. He asked if Fossil understood. The man agreed. The boss ordered the guy to inform him how the search party from the north would return. When the boss left, Fossil said that the princess should continue to warm this useless hope because everything would get worse. The barrier is gone. The guys came to Malini's company. Kai decided to go straight. Sarah got scared and said they were going to another place. He said that everything was fine and she could leave it to him and his plan. He asked her to keep quiet for a while. He decided that from that moment on, he was a noble, rich and arrogant, arrogant and cheeky, a typical nobleman. From the moment he opened the door, he was greeted there and asked if he had come to buy a servant. The guy said that's right, and they should call the owner. He said he was going to offer a big deal. The boss greeted him and told him that his name was Malini and he was the owner of the company. Kai thanked him and said that he came from a small kingdom. He travels in secret so the man should forget that Kai was there today. He said that he had managed to pick up something interesting. He turned to Ebus, who immediately threw Sarah to the floor. The boss was shocked, but Sarah didn't understand anything. Kai asked if this was the same sorceress who had recently escaped. The man asked if he was returning it. He couldn't believe it. Kai asked if his efforts were being compensated. The man agreed and asked why Kai decided to bring her back. He asked if the guy didn't know how much the sorceress was worth. Kai admitted that the girl herself asked to be sold to another merchant in order to redeem the princess with the proceeds. He said it was an amazing dedication. He said that then he was interested in this princess, who has such loyal subjects. A valuable servant is a rarity. He said he had to be very honest if he wanted to get access to such a product. The boss said he understood. Sarah asked why. She said that even if he handed her over to him, that price would not be enough to buy the princess back. She exclaimed, asking if he had said he would save her. She said he promised. Kai looked at the man. He agreed and said he planned to buy her out. He admitted that money is not a problem for him. He didn't need to sell her to buy the princess. So he wondered if it wouldn't be better for her to just return to the company. He said that the princess would be saved and the seller was happy. Everything is in the black. Sarah exclaimed that the money would not be enough, and Ebis closed her mouth. Kai apologized to the boss for this and thanked him for allowing him to consider the guy's proposal. He asked where the princess was. The man said they should move to another room. He ordered Sarah to be taken away as soon as possible. Kai asked why not let the girl meet the princess as a reward for loyalty, because this is their last opportunity to say goodbye. The boss didn't mind, but not for long. Kai was sad, because he loves this kind of thing. The boss said it was terrible. He almost went crazy when his soldiers let her escape. As Kai saw, the man did not pay them. The guy said they screwed up big time. He asked if these were the personal soldiers working under contract. The boss confirmed this, saying that he was sending them straight to the front line to receive servants. They were in the room behind them. Kai understood him. Tea was placed on the table. The boys sat down, and the servants were brought into the room. Kai wondered if they were guards. Suddenly Sarah exclaimed the princess's name. The girl was standing in shackles. Kai froze. The boss said to look at her. A special class servant recommended by the Malini company. The Pearl of Mondial, Yuri Cecilia. The man introduced a high-class servant, Princess Yuri Cecil. He said that Kai could take his time with the check. She had beautiful long blonde hair and bangs almost to her eyes. The girl reminded Kai of Rukia. He said that the princess was beautiful and asked about the price. The man showed the prices that amazed Kai. For the discount amount of the bazaar, you can buy a small house, but for the full amount you can get a luxury mansion. But now Kai will have to make this purchase. He said it was unexpected and asked the man if he was sure everything would be okay. He asked if this price was discounted. The man noticed that Kai guessed. Yuri Cecilia is their best product. 
she is called the Mondial Gem. Even the emperor was captivated by her beauty. He couldn't sell it cheap. He said that he was only giving her away at that price because Kai had returned Sarah. The guy understood him. Kai was about to agree when suddenly Sarah screamed and called the princess. She fell to the floor. Her familiar wizards and Yuri sadly noticed that she had failed to escape. Sarah looked at Kai as the reason for this. She tried to come to her senses, because if he saves Yuri and the others, it doesn't matter if they sell her. She had already decided to trust him. That's why she decided she should be grateful. She lowered her head and said she was very sorry. Sarah smiled and asked Yuri to give her the opportunity to say goodbye. She wanted to meet the princess one last time before her heart broke. The princess was touched. The rest of the servants also succumbed to feelings. Kai told the owner not to force him to watch this pathetic scene, even though he was enjoying it. Kai said that since they were there, he would like to buy those guards as well. He let the boss go until he chooses. The man agreed and left. He thought that the guy was very strange, because he spoke too well for his age. He also noticed that Kai's hands looked like he was digging in the ground. He thought that he shouldn't treat the guy the same as the others. He thought it couldn't be Mondial, pushing the thoughts away from himself. One of the servants ran up, shouting Malini's name. The boss asked what had happened. The servant apologized and reported the words of the soldiers, who asked for the boss to be called immediately. They didn't understand what was wrong. At this time, Sarah turned to Kai and asked if he could buy all the guards. The servants were amazed by these words. Sarah said that Kai must have his own circumstances, but she begged him. He apologized for making such an expression on his face because of her. He also knew how difficult it was to be away from important people. Suddenly, Ibis took out a dagger and told Sarah not to move. She cut the ropes on her arms. Kai stated that this was the reason he did not want her to experience such terrible pain. Ibis quickly freed everyone in the room. Sarah asked what he was doing. The guy said that time was short, so he would be brief. He told everyone who wanted to escape to join hands. They didn't understand what he was talking about. Kai didn't expect them to trust him so easily, but he has no proof that he can really save them. Yuyuri looked at him. Kai exclaimed that in case they didn't want to end their days here, then he was giving them a chance. Yuri quickly went to him. Everyone was surprised. The girl stood up and looked into his eyes. She noticed that he was different, unlike the vulgar gaze of a merchant and the greedy gaze of a mercenary. And unlike her desperate gaze, he was different. She turned around and took Sarah's hands, then called the other guys. One by one, they all joined hands. Sarah held out her hand to him because she was the last one. Kai told Ibis that they would act according to the plan. He told her to do it as quickly as possible. He said Tenohira again. At this time, the boss came downstairs. He was told that the detachment from the north had returned. He asked why it took so long. They said they seemed to have found the sorceress, and when they were about to catch her, they were attacked. Then they were stripped and tied to trees. The boss asked what he was saying. The servant assumed that whoever brought Sarah was the culprit. The boss slammed his hand on the table and ordered Fazel to be called, and called the others to follow him. When he arrived, he saw the ruined room where Ibis was standing. She quickly jumped down. The boss ordered me to follow her. When Fazel came, he noted that it was terrible. He asked if it was an enemy magician. The boss did not know, because he had lost his vigilance, he said they took a high-class servant and they definitely came from Mondial. Fazel grinned. He said that the girl lacked combat experience and she couldn't entertain him, but there is definitely someone strong among them. The boss asked why he was impressed and ordered him to follow her. Fazel clarified that the servants had their feet in shackles and said that he alone would be enough. The boss ordered everyone back. He said that Sarah had escaped and Fazel's subordinates had been defeated. Now Yuri has escaped with all the guards. He asked how Fazel would fix it. The man said that since it was in order, there was nothing to be done. At that time, someone saw Ebis. Kai told her that she would not win, and it was better for her to pretend that she was covering the rear. The girl ran away, thinking that using magic would be easier. She wondered if the owner and everyone else were okay. Sarah screamed and cried, asking what it was and where they were. Kai asked her to calm down, because the others are not surprised. The princess was calm. 
This scared the guy more than it worried him. Enel asked what they would do with these supplies, and whether it was worth giving them to the villagers. The guy was surprised that she did it. He said they would deal with it later. He asked for a sword, which he took from the mercenaries. Kai apologized to Sarah, because he acted for sure. The girl was completely sure that he had betrayed her. She asked where they were, because they had just been in the company building. The guy said he would explain later, and first he needed to get rid of the shackles. The servants asked what kind of sword it was. Kai said he would break the chain by winding it on the sword. He saw it in the movie. The princess asked what kind of place it was. The guy stated that this space is part of the power of his blessing. If they go beyond it, they will return to the same place. So it's not worth doing this yet. The girl asked if he was somehow connected with Mondial. The guy didn't even know that there was a country with that name. He met Sarah by chance yesterday. She asked him to save the princess, and that was it. He said if they needed a reason, it was because he was interested in Sarah. The girl was surprised. He said that's why he decided to save everyone, and her first. Sarah was confused and asked about the idea of selling it and using the money. He apologized for not saying right away. He promised to save, but he did not specify who exactly. The princess laughed. She said she would lose count if she started remembering all the times Sarah had saved her. And since the country and its people are in the past, now she is only Yuri Cecilia. Kai wanted to say something, but waved it away and told her to forget. He noticed that Sarah treats her like a younger sister, but he shouldn't say that. Even he's not that stupid. Ibis was running away from the mercenaries. They were amazed at her speed. They asked where the others had gone. There were ten servants with channels on their feet, and they would not have had time to escape along this road. They realized that this was a hoax, and they needed to return to the company building. Ibis remembered Kai's words that she needed to distract them as long as possible. He didn't mind if she beat them up. Remembering this, the girl turned to them. They asked if she had decided to tell them where the others had gone. The girl said that everyone had already gone ahead. All she has left is to defeat them. They were surprised by her magic. She defeated them quickly and easily. She was thinking of going back to her master. Suddenly, someone said that she had amazing abilities. Fazl challenged her to a magic duel. Kai asked if everyone was ready. As soon as he cancels the ability, they will return to the company building. While Ibis distracts the mercenaries, they will try to get out of the city quickly. He told Enel to cook the very thing. They proceeded and cancelled the spell. The boss was standing there talking to himself. He was wondering why Fazl was still missing. They couldn't have run far, and he assumed they were close. The guys appeared behind him. He was in shock. It was bad. The servants quickly threatened him with weapons. Sarah asked what they should do. Kai said they needed to tie him up. After they did this, the boss asked how dare they. He heard some kind of sound. This is the Battle of Evis. He wanted to ask his boss about Sarah's collar, but it wasn't the right time. He told the guys to hurry up. The boss told them to stop because they were his product. Kai told the man not to even try to get the princess and Sarah back. He said that the man was just a bandit who decided to profit from the ashes of a fallen country so he needed to think of it as a dream. They got out, and the guy told Yura to hurry up. The girl asked Yuri to climb on her back. Kai exclaimed that Sarah was too fragile, and it was better to ask the man in front of them. Sarah said that the princess would not agree. He said she was no longer a princess. These men were mercenaries. It wasn't the right time. They were surrounded. Sarah asked them what to do, because they had been found. The guy thought that since they were there, that magician became the opponent of Ebus. He thought she would be fine, but a more experienced opponent might surpass her in combat tactics. The guys asked Kai what to do. They decided to fight. The guys said that Kai helped them, but he didn't have to participate. He can take the princess and run. The guy appreciated their concern, but refused. He turned to Sarah and asked if that was the magician who defeated her. He wasn't there. He asked the guys to cover for him, he said he'd be right back, and they should stay like that. He activated Tenohira and disappeared. Kai returned and brought the combat experts with him. Two soldiers were walking by. Suddenly, a mercenary fell in front of them. They asked what he was doing, 
and if he knew that it was wrong to arrange such a thing in the city. The man said something about servants. The guards asked if he was from Molina's company, and their servants rarely run around these days. They saw the guys. They raised their weapons and told them to stop running and come back. Suddenly, Kai's little warriors appeared on the field. There were a lot of them. The mercenaries asked what it was. Kai diligently increased their population throughout the year and decided to keep them in reserve in Tenohir. This is his squad of combat SH Pendix. He told them not to hold back. The mercenaries were confused. They asked to call someone who could use Luke's blessing. It was too dark there and the warriors were winning. Yuri's servants said that these babies were very strong and cute. Sarah asked if they were on their side. Kai confirmed it. The warriors quickly defeated all the mercenaries. Kai praised them and said that it was already time. He thanked them for their work and said they could come back and rest. The warriors are gone. Kai said that the combat SH Pendix, who are still able to fight, will go with them. He also told the guys to run until reinforcements arrived. At that time, explosions were heard. Fossil did not understand what kind of abilities Ebis had. No matter how many attacks he repelled, there was no end to them. Kai saw Ebis. He was surprised, because she was winning. Sarah assumed that the girl had exceeded Fossil's expectations. Kai told Ebis that it was a good job. She smiled, glad that he was alive. Fossil was panting. He cursed when he saw the girl's owner. He said that if he had a mage of that caliber, then he didn't know why the guy wouldn't let her fight in the war. If she had taken part in it, they would not have lost the country. Sarah assumed that Fossil thought the guys were from Mondial. Kai said that Fossil was wrong, and he just happened to stumble upon them and decided to help. The magician did not believe it. Kai asked if Fossil would surrender because he had already neutralized the other soldiers. The man called Kai a fool because warriors do not give up halfway. He was going to fight to the end. Kai noted that Fossil was already exhausted. He asked Ebus if she would buy them three minutes. She agreed. He tried to attack them, but the girl easily returned. Kai was left behind. Ebus attacked him, but Fossil dodged. When he was in the right place, Kai grabbed his arm. Fossil asked where the guy came from. Kai exclaimed that he was from Tenohira. They ended up in Tenohir. Fossil was shouting, asking where they were. The man asked what Kai had done to him. At this time, the guy rushed to Enel. He asked if they were starting a plan. The girl agreed. She screamed loudly that there were enemies there. She screamed that they were attacked, and people need to gather there, because this is not a drill. As she had already told them, people should take a stick or farm tools with them and get together. She told the women and children to stay inside. She called on the villagers, saying that a bad guy had come, whose goal was the harvest. If they don't get rid of him, he will take away their crops. She's worried about it too. Enel said that it could be that their daughters would be taken away. She asked what they would do. She wondered what Fossil had done. The man said he didn't know where he was, but he had no reason to fight them. He only had business with the guy behind them. They turned to look at Kai, but saw no one. The guy understood that the villagers could not see him. Residents were angry to learn that he was targeting children. They shouted that they wouldn't let him. Fossil asked if they really wanted this, because he was a magician. He didn't care how many of them were there. He tried to use magic, but it didn't work out. He was very surprised. He thought it was impossible. After that, he realized that magic does not work in this place, and in fact it simply does not exist there. Kai grinned. He thought it was a brilliant guess. Tenohira was a place where the abyss, inexhaustibly firing magic, could not even budge. Fossil was surrounded. He tried to conjure again, saying that they shouldn't look at him so arrogantly. The magic was leaving his body, but he could do it. Kai was very surprised. Fossil charged. He created a weak flash, and the residents got scared. When they saw that he had fired fire, they said that they needed to protect the village. They rushed at Fossil, who was surprised by their ignorance of magic. He tried to get a weapon, thinking that he would have to fight like this. Suddenly, one of the warriors snatched out his weapon. Fossil was angry, because everything was one after the other. It wasn't funny, because he was losing because of such stupidity. He thought that there was no way out 
and he would lose to Kai. After a while, he was lying on the ground, all beaten up. Enel said with a smile that that was enough. She didn't think he would wake up soon. The girl praised the residents. They tied Fazal up and left him on the ground. Kai asked if Enel thought that this world would not become as cruel. The girl replied that anything is possible. They had already tried to explain to them that sometimes a person is much more dangerous than monsters, although she did not know if this was for the best. Kai said that even if it remained peaceful, it's not such a bright world. The girl looked at him and said with a smile that everything was fine. She told him to just do what he thought was right. Kai smiled and also thanked the girl for her words. After a while, he returned to the guys. Sarah was worried. They saw Fazel tied up and asked how he did it. Kai said it was because of his strategy. Yuri asked what he was going to do with this man. The guy said he would just throw it away somewhere, and now they have to escape from there. They left Fazel there. After some time, Kai said that they were probably far enough away. He said that Ebus was good too and she was probably tired of using magic non-stop. The girl said that this was not the case. She was upset because she couldn't do what he asked. She said she was useless. Kai denied this, saying that the enemy was simply more persistent than he was. The reason he was able to save everyone was precisely Ebus. He said she was very helpful. The girl was shy. Kai said again that Ebus is the best. She asked him to hug her. When he hesitated, she said that by doing this, she calms down and feels relieved. Kai awkwardly hugged her. Even Sarah blushed at that. Suddenly, Yuri turned to him. She said that she was thanking him as a representative. She thanked him for saving her. The guy smiled and said that half of it was just a guy's whim. And instead she better tell if they have a place where they can go now. He thought that in case they have nowhere to go, he wants to take them to the island. However, he can barely survive there, although he has the ability he couldn't force them. The servants were silent and looked at them. The princess turned around and with a sad expression on her face said that they had nowhere to go, much less return. So she asked him to make them his servants. As ministers, they will be his thing. People from this city probably won't be able to rely on them. The guy understood them. He confessed that he was not a merchant. Sarah was surprised. He said that they actually live on a no-man's island in the middle of nowhere. In truth, it was an uncharted land that takes everything they have just to live. He asked if they had the determination to do so. Yuri didn't say anything. One of the guys thought about it. He said it was the most suitable place to hide. They asked if this was a place where there was bare land without water. The guy said that there are rivers and forests there. The guys noted that there is soil and a source of water there which is enough for them. Kai was silent. Yuri said that he really did not know the Principality of Mondial. She said that their country had a lot of offensive nicknames, saying that it was just a village. Kai said in surprise that he thought it was a very big country. The princess explained that they live with the earth. They thought No Man's Island was a fun idea. They decided to think about its layout. Kai also said that he wanted her to promise him one thing after she came to the island. She said he could ask for as much as he wanted. He explained that revenge is strictly forbidden. He asked the girl to forget all about the empire and not think of it as a rebirth. If she couldn't promise that, then he wouldn't give her the island. Yuri turned cold, then smiled and agreed, because she no longer thinks about revenge. Even if she did it, there was no one else to be happy about it. So there was no point. Kai said that was all and invited Ibis home. They joined hands and found themselves back on Tenohir, then they went north. He said that if they left there, they would come to the island. There are two girls there that he asked the guys to get along with. After moving, Sarah got scared. Kai said it was a no man's island. There's nothing there, and they're probably disappointed. He heard a loud scream. Ren hugged him very tightly. She rejoiced at his return and said that he had been gone too long. She thought he wasn't coming back. Kai apologized for making her sad. Keed was very happy to see them. She hugged Ebis and Kai. She looked at the new people. Kai said they were new residents. Yuri greeted the girl. Sarah asked if they were the only ones there. She asked what about the guy's home country. Kai said they still exist, but they can't come back now. That was the main reason. He told the guys that they could see for themselves that there was nothing on the island. From now on, they will be the pioneers of this island. 
They will create everything. They will create their own country. Kai was going to make a place to return to for everyone. The guys were inspired by this idea. Sarah grinned when she heard about the new country. She said that her heart is incredibly happy now. Ren smiled and said that everything was exactly as one would expect from my lord. Keed exclaimed that she would also help the guys. Ibis looked at him and said that she would also follow the master because she was part of his family. Sarah looked at Yuri, who laughed softly. The princess sighed, saying how nice it was. She said they were the ones who had lost everything, and now they could start from scratch. Outside of the flower vase, they will grow their new roots. Suddenly she turned to Kai. He turned when she grabbed his arm. The guy was surprised and asked her what she was doing. Yuri smiled and said that they should create a beautiful country where everyone would be happy. She said she would do her best too. Sarah exclaimed that she would also do her best as Kai's wife. The guy was very surprised by these words. The girl said that this has been the case since they shared a bed. Life on the island was in full swing. Ibis performed some quick but very precise manipulations that made a whistle. At this time, some people were looking at her and wondering if this girl looked like a demon from old legends. The second person asked if she looked like that. This was the first time they had seen such strange magic. Keed, who heard this conversation, calmly said that Ibis was not a demon at all. She said that the demons she read about at school were strange, but Ebis, on the contrary, was very kind and gentle. The girl smiled and said that Ren was quite an unexpected surprise when she first arrived on the island. They thought about it, because they saw that Ren was clearly a beastman. One of the girls asked what difference it made who she was or what she was, because she was very strong and soft. Many people wanted to stroke or touch Ren's tail. They noted how soft she was. The girl blushed deeply from such attention, she awkwardly called Kai when this happened. The guy with a smile could tell that everything was going pretty smoothly from the very beginning. Suddenly, Ibis said that Kai's shoes were too worn. Kai explained this by saying that he has been wearing these shoes since he was 12 years old. Although he had already increased the size of these shoes once, the guy thought about it. It turned out that the problems were not only with his shoes, but also with clothes and even tools. He was thinking that he should get the opinion of the others on this matter. Kai raised his hand, drawing everyone's attention. He said that in this regard he was opening the first meeting of the islanders. He, Kai Husqvarna, will be the chairman of this meeting. The guy asked if the guys wanted anything. Immediately after this question, answers began to pour in. Some asked to take clothes and shoes, others needed tools for the farm, because if they could get oil, they could cook new dishes. Some asked if they could get tools for fishing. Some just wanted to take a bath, while others wanted more toilets. There were also those who wanted to eat delicious meat. Keed dutifully wrote everything down. Kai thought about it, saying that if they can get it urgently, then the problem will be solved, but it will be quite difficult to make plumbing. Suddenly, Yuri raised her hand, she asked for permission to speak. When Kai informed her that he was ready to listen to her, the girl said that there were only three elements that they needed to create a country. These elements were the townspeople, the territory, and the administration. She said it was understandable that the island lacked all that. She asked the guy's opinion. Kai thought deeply. Their territory was an island and their management was combat power. They have several magicians, so it should be relatively quiet at the front. He looked at Yuri and said with an awkward smile that the problem was with the townspeople. Yuri closed her eyes and said with a smile that everything was as expected, and Kai answered correctly. The guy said that he did not understand if there really was a quick method to increase the number of citizens. Yuri slyly said that there really is one. Kai asked in surprise if she was talking about getting a few more military coons. The girl shook her head, saying that this was not the case. She looked at him with a sly smile and said that there was a much more conventional, world-class method. It also depends on Kai's own efforts. The guy asked in surprise what she was talking about because he did not understand her at all. The girl sat down and said that it was possible to make children. Upon hearing this, everyone was amazed. Ebis was at a loss. She said that if they were going to create a country, then Kai was the king of that country. At that moment, the girl exclaimed that at the same time, 
The royal blood of the Mondial Principality flows in her, the guy blushed deeply, not understanding how everything could turn into this. The girl came closer and said that if he accepted the fact that he would become the king of their country, then he would have to take responsibility for procreation. It worked the same way as the increase in townspeople. She asked if it was important. Kai awkwardly looked away and said that he thought it was really important. He understood what Yuri Cecilia meant by that. The girl smiled and told him to just call her by her first name. Kai repeated her full name and surname again. She again asked him to change his address, which is why he still had to do it. She was pleased. In truth, Kai didn't have a single idea what the girl was thinking. He thought it might be a sense of duty because she was royal, but it didn't seem like her own decision. Next. Yuri went up to Sarah and said that she thought it was normal for Sarah be friends with him. He was surprised. He asked if it didn't seem a little big to Yuri. Their house was also full. He said that their hut would not be able to withstand the winter anyway, and he was planning to build a new house. He hoped that someone would know how to do it. One of the girls said it's not a problem, and she knows. He asked if she was a carpenter. The girl's family was doing this, and she knew how to build a house. Kai exclaimed that it was wonderful, so he needed her help in building it. They need a house for everyone. That's about 10 houses. Their warriors will help. Yuri said they don't need to build so much. The king only needs one big palace, and that's enough. Kai thought she was thinking big. Yuri said that Ibis and Ren are magicians. A magician and a guard. They will both serve in the palace. They were both citizens and the army. Kai asked if the attendants would like to do their own housework. The guys said that they can live in two rooms, and this is not a problem. Yuri said that kindness is a benefactor, but as a king he should think more logically. Kai thought she was right. There were 14 people on the island, and it wasn't very practical to do housework for everyone. It's too much work. Yuri said that only one magnificent palace is needed. Everyone can live there. The girl walked away and took people in her arms. She said that they would start building the country from there. Kai looked with burning eyes at the girl who was building goals. A magnificent place where they can return at any moment. She said they would be honored to live in such a place. Kai sighed and smiled, thinking that she was right. He thought it was completely out of position or something. Everything was much simpler there. People will be lonely if everyone lives on their own. Ibis looked at Kai in disbelief, who was smiling so dreamily. The guy enthusiastically exclaimed that now their main goal is to build a palace. They have to build it before this winter. The girl exclaimed that she would try her best for this. After a while, Kai arrived in Tenohira. There he immediately called Enel to him. He informed the girl about it is said that they will be building a palace, so they need materials. Suddenly there was a strong gust of wind, from which Enel came out. She shouted joyfully that she was congratulating him, because the village had reached the 20th level. He remembered the various resources from the city. He remembered that there had recently been a 12th level, which meant that he had gained 8 more levels. He turned around enthusiastically and said that this meant that there should be some kind of reward. The girl looked away awkwardly. Suddenly, another girl, taller, appeared behind her. She happily said that it was her. The girl was glad that she was finally there. Kai asked in surprise who it was. The girl said that it was very nice to meet her, and she is Enel's younger sister. She is an auxiliary elf who manages clothes, part of three vital things with a hut and food together. Her name was Koromo. Kai, perplexed, asked what kind of clothes she was talking about. Koromo took out a small pillow with a needle and said she could make clothes for him. Kai exclaimed that she was cool. He was just thinking about what to do with clothes for everyone. It solved his problem. She said she was a little different from Enel, who couldn't do anything but eat. Koromo also has special abilities. Enel asked why her sister was saying that, the girl stated that she looks like she doesn't know how to do anything, but in fact she is a guest who can find the most delicious food and check it for poison. She has a very important job. Kai was sure that she just likes to eat. Enel was offended. She hoped that at least Kai would understand her. In truth, the guy already had suspicions. Since he has been living on this island, he has never been poisoned. He said he was grateful to Enel. 
She asked if that was the case. Koromo said that if he ordered her to do something while there were materials in Tenno here, she would do everything. But she couldn't do a bunch of things. One outfit for three days is easy. He was surprised. The girl said that it was three days according to the time of the outside world. She starts with calculations and then proceeds to manufacture. He asked if she could make shoes. He wanted leather shoes. She agreed. Kai said she was amazing. He turned around and said he would go find out the size of the others. Enel exclaimed that he was like an impatient child. He unlocked not only Koromo. He was surprised. It became a hidden village with magic. He looked at Enel. The girl said it was because the mercenary leader often attacked them. There are no magicians right now, and it doesn't look like mana has been created. The concept of magic has become something that just is. Functions on the type of yield and synthesis of seeds were also added. He could understand the yields, but he did not understand the synthesis. Enel said it was a synthesis of similar colored seeds. He could create more powerful warriors. He wanted to test them. But unfortunately, all the seeds had already become warriors. Even those that were turned back into seeds in the city have returned. Enel suggested trying it after reaching new levels. He noticed that she said so, but according to the condition, it was necessary to create a magician. Enel asked who knows what might happen before he realized. After three days, the shoes were ready. Kai really liked it. Koromo said that since it's a water buffalo, the skin texture is a little different. She began to actively talk about the creation process, but Kai stopped her. He decided to try on shoes. When he put them on, Koromo asked his opinion. They approached the guy, and Koromo was delighted. She awkwardly said that she was sure of it. Kai asked her to make others such a pair of shoes. She asked if she was more useful than Enel. The girl exclaimed that her sister should not compare them. Kai smiled, which Enel noticed. Sarah said it was time to calculate the time. Everyone needs a well or water supply for agriculture. If this is not possible, then a pond is needed. She offered to take the water pots. He was delighted and asked why they hadn't thought about it before. He thanked Sarah for the idea. He decided that he needed to find clay and make dishes. After that, he changed the solution to ceramics. They will be able to store water in pitchers and make food in pots. However, the guy's knowledge from his previous life was limited to the TV show. He's lucky they have someone familiar with the technology. The girl said she didn't know anything. She's from a merchant's family. Her father took her to the pottery workshop for observations. Kai said that her knowledge was already helping. They need to start with the demon ceramics. He asked Ibis if she knew where to get the clay. The girl said that she had not seen her before, so she did not know. He said that everything was fine because clay could not be found on the road. He told the girl that they needed to find a swamp. She said she could help with that. Ibis asked if he thought they would find her there. According to Rhea, clay can be found where river silt accumulates. Also, large trees do not grow next to good clay. One of the warriors typed something. He was very dirty. Kai said that's not it. Kai forgot to take Ren with him. She usually translated the warrior's speech for him. He said the clay was like sticky grayish mud. The warriors replied that they understood and went back to the swamp. Ibis asked if they understood. Kai noted that they looked confident, so he didn't think to worry. They have been going down the river for a long time but they have not found anything. Kai thought that if there was no way out with the river, then they should look at the rocks. Ibis asked if there was clay there. The water rippled behind them. Kai thought that clay could be found on the surface of the rock. A warrior rose from the water. They brought many baskets of clay. Kai was surprised and said they would leave her there for now. He squeezed it. Ibis asked if it was the same substance. Kai confirmed it. It is quite soft, so it is easy to shape it. It will harden as soon as they burn it. It will make a wonderful water jug. Ibis said that Kai really knows a lot. The guy thought that his knowledge was superficial. He wished he had studied more. He told the warriors to take as much as they could carry, and he would bring some to Tenohira. After a while, they returned. Kai asked the girl how she felt. She said that there is excellent plasticity and stickiness. To get rid of impurities, they will dry it. Then knock everything out of it and filter it out. She asked where they would put the oven. With that, Kai went to Enel. 
She said that the locals use banana leaves as dishes. That's why he thought of installing a stove there, because time goes faster. So he didn't worry about firewood. Enel asked what kind of oven he wanted to make. Kai remembered the one he had seen on TV. It consists of many chambers built in the form of an inclined tunnel. The fire will be lit at the lower chamber. The shape was weird, but it wasn't a bad thing. The girl understood everything in general terms and was ready to start. One of the residents was making a bread oven at his parents' house and could help. Kai was counting on them. He asked Enel if she could ask the locals for help. The girl agreed, and the work went in full swing. A few days later, the oven was ready. It wasn't accurate, but they were done with the main part. Enel said that the most important thing is principle and understanding. She told Kai to show the villagers what and how, and they would quickly learn from their own mistakes. Kai said he had an idea. Soon he came with the residents to Ren. There the guys played with Kai's friends. They were faster than the guy expected. Ren asked if he wanted to play with them. Kai liked this idea, but he had a question for the fox. He asked if she wanted to go to Tenohira's with him. Keed came over and asked if she could go too. With a smile, Kai agreed. He shouted the name of the village of Tenohira again, after which they found themselves there. Keed looked around admiringly, because Kai's village had become bigger. The guy noted that the wheat fields were finally ready. Recently, the population has also increased. Suddenly, Keed saw a girl leading a little boy. She felt sad. Kai asked what happened. Keed said she wondered if everything was okay with her mom and dad. Ren came over and asked Keed if her hometown was big. She confirmed this, because if you go to the stone pavement there, you can come to the castle. Since her dad worked at the castle, she and her mom often went there to meet him. Ren noticed that they got along well. Keed said she was an only child. Kai said that even if not in the near future, he would definitely find the girl's hometown. She smiled and said she knew it wasn't easy, but she was counting on him. She thought her parents were crying because she was missing. Kai said that her parents were nice. Enel asked if he was finished. He apologized and told her to gather the villagers to make an announcement. A real magician was going to create fire for them. He wanted to see their faces. Enel laughed slyly. Keed asked if they were going to light the stove without him. He didn't know if they would hold up or not. So he was going to warm up the oven first to get rid of the moisture. The residents came. Enel called their attention. She said that he is the most famous hellfire magician, and now they are using her to light the furnace. The residents were surprised. Ren didn't understand why everyone was looking at her. The residents supported her. Ren was shy. Kai said that she should just light a fire instead of using a strong flame. She agreed and created a fire. Everyone was surprised and crowded around her. Kai said it was worth doing the real thing next. Keed was making jugs. The guy asked how she does it. The girl was very skilled. Yuri was interested. Keed answered only in monosyllables. Ren showed Kai the clay warrior she had made herself. Kai asked what it was. The girl said it was a warrior. Kai said they make clay molds, not ceramic dolls. Keed asked if he could make dolls too. Kai could do it, but he wasn't sure if they could burn them properly. They will fall apart if there is air inside. Keed noted that he can make dolls. Ibis told Sarah about how many of them there were. The girl said that they were mostly kitchen utensils. Dishes and pots for cooking, small pots and jars for storing ingredients. It would be good if they lived up to practical use. Ibis noticed that Sarah looked happy. After that, the items dried in Tenno here. They put all the things in the oven after drying, and Ren created a fire. At the end of the process, Kai asked Enel how the firing was going. The girl said it had been about 10 hours and she didn't know if they should increase the fire. They will be getting items soon. Kai asked if he could watch it now. Enel assumed that they would fall apart if they were cooled down sharply. It is necessary to slowly lower the temperature. It would take several days, but in the world they will do one. Kai said that all the stages take much longer than he thought. Enel said he could think of it as teaching the villagers. The next day they took out the dishes. Ren asked how it went. The guy said they were burned and it wasn't as bad as he expected. Keed was looking for her flower pot while Ren was looking for her warrior. Enel congratulated Kai. 
With this, the village will become the center of the origin of ceramics. The girl said that this is just a biscuit and you need to glaze it and really burn it. Kai thought that the path of ceramics is not easy. The earth was flying out of the pit in different directions. Kai asked the little creature with the red riding hood if he could do his job. He answered again in his own language and Ray translated what he said, which is not very good. The guy was awkwardly surprised. The girl still did not understand why they needed a well. After all, there were enough water jugs. Kai replied that there is a huge difference between taking water directly from the village and to ask the raccoon warriors to carry it from the river. The guy was thinking that he definitely had to make the island self-sufficient and people stopped relying on Tenohira. He must create a country in which everyone could live, and everything will be fine. Of course, if something happens to him, Ray immediately noticed him, and thought that he thought they couldn't do it. Then suddenly Ray hung on Kai's neck and said that it was impossible because they had this cutie keyed. The girl stood there, feeling a little awkward, but then she beamed and called him brother. She wanted him to go with her, but she grabbed his hand. He didn't understand why she grabbed him so abruptly. Keed replied that she couldn't bring him here, so she asked him to come with her again. She ran forward to the barn, holding Kai's hand. The guy was trying to figure out if she was talking about something from the clay shed. The girl pointed at something and said she wanted to burn him in her brother's village. There was a monster with horns sitting in the clay shed. Keed stood waiting for Kai's reaction to him, but he was shocked. He was trying to realize that it was a clay doll that Keed had made. She confirmed that it was her job, and if she could get him to move, she could help with the construction of the castle. She also said that it would be good to fry it, otherwise it would just crumble. Kai smiled contentedly because he understood everything. He was looking at the clay robot created by Keed. The girl at that moment wanted to say that she was counting on him, but sneezed. This immediately puzzled Kai. He sat down next to Keed and was afraid that she had caught a cold. She was a little creased, but said that when she woke up in the morning, her throat was a little sore, but everything was fine. Kai asked Ren to stay with Keed. She immediately agreed. Kai at this time put his hands on the robot and moved to Tenohir. Enel immediately looked in surprise at the guy who appeared. Kai informed her that he wanted to burn him in the village. She replied, surprised by the size of the clay sculpture, that she would ask the villagers about it. The guy noticed that he had a rather complicated shape, but the girl said that it was was nothing. Enel noticed that the skills of the locals are developing rapidly, because this is a world created by Alamilla's blessing, and they can handle even complex projects. The second elf offered citrus tea. Kai understood everything and thanked him for the tea. He also continued that pottery production had reached great heights here. It happened after they made a bunch of cutlery and cooking pots, while laughing. He also added that Sarah seemed so happy to him, and he was amazed that she was surprisingly good even even at cooking. She was an aristocrat after all. But Enel knew about it, because most of the joys of life come only from good food. She looked at the second elf, who puffed out her cheeks. Kai thought with a malicious grin that this was the reason. Sarah turned when she saw Kai. The girl was holding a spatula in her hands and wiping it with a cloth. She apologized and asked to bring some more groceries. The guy thought he had forgotten something. The girl put a headscarf on her head and said that she usually cooks the same thing because she uses this opportunity to replace the main product of our diet. This amazed the guy. He was glad that they would finally be able to say goodbye to potatoes. The girl laughed and said that if he had free time, would he like to help him? Kai thought it was a great idea and decided to start the products they had. There were those that they took soon, as well as what they began to grow in Tenno here. The guy said it would be great if they could harvest crops on the island soon. The girl confirmed it and proudly put her hand on her side. The guy held out the bag and said that now they have wheat flour. Sarah immediately thanked Kai. She looked questioningly at the bag and the contents in it. The girl saw wheat flour for the first time and stirred it with a spoon. The guy did not understand what was wrong, and the girl immediately shouted that the flower was absolutely white. This shocked the guy and because he thought that flower should be white. 
Sarah thought that flour usually has a brown color, so his flour also had a very fine grinding. She didn't understand how he did it. The guy replied that he used wheat ears bought in the city, and he also just crushed them using an ordinary water wheel and a millstone. He thought for a moment and said that he needed to step back and ask something. He immediately went to Tenohira and immediately turned to Enel. She smiled and immediately understood what was going on, and probably it was distorted due to Kai's non-standard perception. The guy was surprised. Enel said that nothing else comes to her mind except that the flower is white only because Kaya believes in it, and that is why wheat flour containing wheat shells, which turns brownish when mixed with yeast, turned white. The guy realized that his perception determines everything. Even at the moment when they are talking, the girl agreed and gave an example of eggs. Kai believes that you can eat raw eggs while they are fresh. The guy was immediately puzzled by this, because as long as they are fresh, everything is fine. But Enel continued that she still couldn't know for sure if the chicken Kai bought was healthy. Natural safety was a dubious thing, but the eggs recently brought here have already become the product of Kai's distorted ideas. That is why they have become safe. Enel drank a freshly broken egg into a plate, but Kai thought he knew that this was a world with broken rules, but to realize that everything was going well because of his superficial knowledge. He also thought thought that he knew a lot, but his knowledge was superficial, and he regretted that he had not studied more. Kai didn't understand if this was a good thing or a bad thing, but, however, he didn't know how to feel about it. The guy returned to the ordinary world and immediately turned to Sarah, saying that it was wheat flour and that she should not doubt it. The girl immediately agreed, but noted that it was the first time she had seen flour of such good grinding. Sarah thought it must be of high quality. Kai stood confused and remembered in his mind that this was just a product of his distorted ideas. The girl at that moment said that they should try to make bread out of her. Kai agreed and decided to beat the eggs for now. The girl looked at him in surprise and thought that where he came from, they put eggs in bread dough. The guy jumped up sharply, without dropping the eggs from the bowl. He immediately replied that they don't do that just not the eggs. His voice sounded scared. He did it again. Kai felt that with such mistakes his mind would go crazy. Sarah remembered that they need to think about the fact that they do not have baking powder for bread, because without it, it will not rise. The guy immediately thought about baking powder for the dough and thought that she meant yeast. The girl only said that she needed to knead the dough and just leave it, but she had never made baking powder. She remembered that there was a baker's son in the royal guard, but he was currently engaged in hard physical labor. Sarah thought he wanted to make flat bread today, but Kai stopped her because he decided to check in Tenno here. The guy immediately turned to Enel. She embarrassedly noticed that he often comes today. Kai was interested in the availability of baking powder for bread in the village. The girl said they didn't have it because they didn't bake bread here. The guy was immediately puzzled because he did not understand what the locals were doing with wheat flour. Enel thought about it and handed him a plate of noodles, answering his question. She explained that it was true, the guy didn't understand how they did it, and the girl, embarrassed, said that this was his special perception again. Kai was annoyed and confused because he definitely likes noodles more than bread. He immediately wanted his favorite noodles. The guy returned to the ordinary world and immediately turned to Sarah, saying that there was no baking powder, so he suggested making noodles, which confused Sarah. She didn't understand what had happened. Kai was immediately embarrassed because he had succumbed to his selfish desires, but the girl, biting her lip, she thought about noodles. She remembered how they had eaten it on the streets of Scorp. The guy thought about the fact that she was very tasty there. Sarah turned enthusiastically to the guy and said that if he likes it so much, then she knows how to cook it. Kai thought that was making it difficult for her, but she replied that if they ate it together, then they should cook it together. She smiled sweetly, which made the guy do the same. After all, she was right, they had already eaten together once. Sarah decided to do the noodle dough because it won't be easy. They began to mix the dough with special difficulty. When they got tired, the warriors began to help them, and eventually they were divided into equal parts. Kai thought they should leave her to lie down and Sarah confirmed and said they could make the sauce for now. She thought they should be in time for dinner. They continued to prepare the dish for dinner. Kai decided to find out if she was happy with her current life or if she was missing something. 
Sarah pointed at herself and thought that she couldn't be seen, because even if she couldn't use magic, she had a place that he could call his own. She is no longer intimidated by neighboring countries, and she can cook so easily, and perhaps this is the kind of life she has always dreamed of. Besides, she decided to add, a little embarrassed, that she could cook with him so easily. This also confused the guy. She turned away from embarrassment. The guy was also embarrassed, and they continued to cook in silence. Evening came, he went to Keed and informed her that he had brought her something to eat. It was supposed to warm her up, because this is what you need during a cold. Keed got up from the bed, and in front of her was Kamatama, a Skropa-style yudon. It contained a raw egg with soy sauce and dasi. The girl twisted noodles on a fork and put them in her mouth. Keed put her hand to her lips and then smiled showing that it was very tasty, which pleased Sarah and Kai. Ray also said it was delicious, and to cutie keyed, the guy looked at the happy people who were smiling while eating noodles. Abyss approached Kai and thought that something was wrong, but the guy denied it. He thought maybe Enel was right. On account of the fact that food is enjoyable, he decided to keep digging. Kai began to eat the noodles he had cooked, and Abyss smiled at him. Day came, Sarah was standing by the kitchen set, tying her apron. Abbas came up to her and addressed her. The cook did not understand what she wanted. The girl with the horns replied that she wanted her to teach her how to cook. Sarah smiled and didn't understand why she was doing this. Abyss explained that she had not been useful to the master before. She couldn't do what he asked. Sara replied that this was completely wrong and that she was thinking too much. The girl was sure that Kai did not think so. Abyss immediately interrupted her because she also wanted to cook for the master so that he would be well fed and happy. She immediately turned away in embarrassment, and Sarah just exhaled. She tried to remember if she had ever mentioned before how tough she could be when it came to cooking. Abyss immediately beamed, saying that she was counting on her. Sarah suggested starting the training with a simple omelette. The girl with the horns happily agreed. Kai returned from the village with a clay robot. He told Keed that he had fried him. The girl immediately became joyful when she saw that he was so dry and looked quite strong. She pointed her hands over the clay and decided to get started. Keed began to use the magic of fleeting existence. The robot's eyes lit up and he stood up, surprising Kai and making Keed happy. The robot began to do exercises. Kai noticed that although it was made of clay, its movements were smooth. Suddenly, clay turned turned to the guy and the girl and unexpectedly bowed to them. Kai expected this from the golem, that he even had top-level manners. Keed did not hear him correctly and called him Shin. The guy sighed and explained that there was a story about a clay doll, that once he was revived in a similar way and people called her a golem. The girl was amazed by such a story, but she liked the name, and she decided to name her Golem Goli, and he immediately raised his hand, indicating that he was here. Kai was surprised by what he had just replied, and he offered to conduct a performance test. Keed immediately agreed and decided to start running short distances. Goli immediately got into the start position, but Keed shouted the command to go, after which he ran at a very fast speed. Goli started running around their settlement. As he ran past Sarah and Abyss, they looked at the rising dust, not understanding what it was. Keed admired his quickness and speed. It seemed to Kai that he was about to fall apart, but, however, he was very strong. Goli stopped abruptly, raising a high column of dust behind him, and Keed exclaimed that he was already at the finish line. Kai was very impressed by the golem's speed, and they decided to proceed to the next stage, which was to carry heavy loads. Keed started looking for something heavy, and when she saw a huge stone, she waited for Kai's approval. In a hurry, she asked Goli to try to lift him. He grabbed a stone, and Kai stood in incomprehension. Because it was not a stone, but a whole block, he was more than sure that he could not cope with such a volume. But Goli easily lifted the huge stone over his head. Kai opened his mouth in surprise, because he had picked it up. Keed threw herself into the golem's arms because he had done an excellent job. She was amazed at the power of Goli, and Kai did not understand how it happened. The guy thought about it, 
He thought that Keed had received the blessing of Alamilla just like him. His consciousness similarly shapes the standard of Tenohira village. He thought that perhaps his abilities were also determined by Keed's logic. And Kai also realized that Alamilla's blessing was a strange thing, because it was not at all surprising that their existence was hidden from the public. Goli picked up Keed in his arms, and she was waiting for a reaction from Kai. The guy was glad that the clay golem was so strong, because now they could rely on its strength. The girl was glad that she could be useful. Kaya smiled at her. Keed announced that she wanted to make a couple more golems, but the guy frowned and thought it was crazy. But she kept her promise and already several golems were building a stone house for the inhabitants of a small settlement. Abis was still learning how to cook, and she wasn't very good at it. Enel and the villagers and warriors, as well as Kai, grew new crops. The guy held a stone in his hand and carved graffiti on the stone, indicating that Kilroy was here. This inscription was made near a large tree, which still towered above the others and was still as powerful. Kai was walking through the village with a fishing rod. After fishing, a settler waved at him, who was very happy. He said that the wheat they had recently planted was able to give its first shoots. The man also suggested making sure to bake bread as soon as it matures. Kai happily replied that he was looking forward to it. Ren saw the guy and turned to him. The guy thought that he had told her about the party today, and now he was preparing everything for the holiday. The girl asked in surprise. It has already been exactly four months since Sarah and the others arrived on the island. Kai and Ren were walking along a stone path, and saw Kaid hugging her living toys. As it turned out, the girl was looking for a guy, because he said he was ready to go. After all, now, at last, their castle, which they were building, was ready. Sarah, with a radiant smile, did not understand why Kai took so long to come to them, because he was the star of the party, so he had to come first. The guy was embarrassed and immediately apologized to everyone, he held out a bucket with a lot of fish in it, saying that today he was able to catch a couple. Sarah was surprised by such a large catch. She resolutely took the bucket of fish and said that she had just cooked it in the kitchen. Ren was interested in the frequency of Kai's fishing trips to the sea. He replied that from time to time he manages to get out there. At this time, Abis ran to them and began to turn to the master. He didn't understand what had happened. The girl was holding a tray in her hands and hesitated a little. She confusedly said that she had been training for a long time and was able to cook it. Abbas asked me to try her dish. Kai was amazed. He really wanted to try the dish from her and said that he would eat it, or rather eat everything. The guy broke off a piece, and Abbas stood in the hope that the dish was delicious. She was interested in the opinion of the master. Kai happily opened his mouth. He couldn't believe that the girl had never cooked. Her dish was very tasty. Abbas immediately beamed and jumped for joy. She was very happy that she had succeeded. Suddenly, Yuri came up to Kai, who was glad that the castle was ready, specifying that this was their royal castle. It was hard for her to call it a royal castle. She immediately corrected herself saying that it was very important to think of it as a castle. Smoke was coming from the chimney, heating the stone building. Yuri went on to say that there was a castle here, and it turned out that this was a country, and if everyone thinks that way, they will try their best. The guy wondered if this was true, but the girl said that they had better start the party as soon as possible, and Kai should have taken the best place in the house. Someone added that he was entitled to it as a king. Abbas handed the guy a glass. In his mind, he laughed at his rank. Kai raised his glass. All the residents began to rejoice and also raise their glasses and thought that from now on he should work even harder, like a king. Or so he thought. Night fell. Abis and Yuri were sitting on the bed and looking at each other. The girl with the horns said she was sleeping with the master. Yuri began to appear so that they would set up a queue. She no longer cared what Abbas said. Another girl was embarrassed and said she would be happy to be at the end of the queue. Kai didn't understand what was going on here at all. Abbas continued to ask that it was her duty to keep the master warm. And this has always been and will always be her responsibility. Yuri shouted that everything was different now because Kai became the king for all of them. The guy was confused. Confused. He thought that this was not what he meant at all, saying that he has to work harder. Abis suggested that he sleep with the three of them. Yuri was shocked because with three it would be too embarrassing. Kai interrupted her, 
saying that Ran and Keed were sleeping together, and everyone is happy, so he offers to be happy here. The princess said that was not what she meant by sleeping. Kai tried to soften the situation by saying that the bed that Yuri had prepared for him was bigger than it needed to be, because it would fit several people, so he suggested getting a good night's sleep. Yuri was confused and tried to insist on her own, but Kai turned away towards the abyss and wished them a good night anyway. Yuri began to address the guy loudly. He thought about Yuri's obsession with the air. He did not understand whether she wanted to preserve the bloodline or make a victim of the child as a representative of Mondal. Kai wasn't going to play along with her so easily since he knows her true intentions. Moreover, he wanted to ask Yuri again about a couple of points. The next day came, Yuri was sitting and talking with Kai. They were talking about her blessing. She, as expected, had already heard of him. Kai said that Sarah had told him, but he still did not understand what kind of blessing he was talking about. The girl realized that he had prepared a room for two people just to ask about it. The guy confirmed that he wanted her to tell him, unless, of course, she had good reason to hide it. Yuri replied that if it was a useful ability, he would be able to use it around the island. She laughed because the temple had strictly instructed her to hide it. But since Mondal was gone, there was no reason to keep that promise. She gathered her thoughts and agreed to tell Kai about everything. He waited expectantly for her to finally tell him, but the girl looked at him in silence. In the end, she came up with a cunning plan, saying that it seemed unfair to her to just talk like that without getting anything in return. The guy was shocked by her words. The girl put her fingers to her mouth and quietly said about the opportunity. She said that maybe she would be satisfied with hugs as a reward. While the girl hugged herself with her arms, Kai was shocked. He repeated her request questioningly. Yuri thought that he didn't like the idea, and if the problem was hugging, then he could. Without finishing, Kai interrupted her. He did not see any problems, but trying to find a way out of an awkward situation, he offered to do it after, and he repeated it again. But the girl was already stretching out her arms to him. At the same moment she clung to him with her whole body, embracing him. She invoked the War Maiden's shelter spell. Yuri pressed Kai against the wall which suddenly appeared, which surprised the guy too. The girl explained that she had received a blessing from the god of the shield, Lane, her ability to create an impenetrable divine shield. A few years ago at the Sunday school of Rabarid, the priest addressed the children, saying that the saints used the power of their blessings to save many people. Yuri raised her hand and addressed the priest. She did not understand how magic differs from blessing. The man replied that magic is the power of destruction used in battles, and the blessings are miracles of the main god Farley. These forces had nothing to do with the war. Kai thought about his words and was confused by the position he still stood in with Yuri. He smiled when he heard about the shield god Lime, and was also surprised by the combat power. The girl laughed. She repeated that it was her blessing, namely, the creation of transparent impregnable walls around the user. She called it a kind of war maiden's hideout. She also used it when they snuggled closer in the scorpion. The guy understood everything, but still did not understand why they were standing so close. The girl smiled and admitted that she had made him like this on purpose. She also thought that he was hoping for a longer distance. The guy was in shock. The girl got closer to him. Her goal was to seduce Kai, so she purposely made him smaller. She wasn't going to let him escape. Yuri put her hand on Kai's cheek. He blushed very much. She started laughing, thinking that he was tired of her. She turned her head, and Abbas was standing in the doorway. Kai said at the time that he would never get tired of her, but she just had to keep being herself, and everything would be fine. Abyss was reaching out to him, but the guy couldn't hear her. Yuri explained that sound blocking is a disadvantage of her ability. Abyss held out her hand and her finger bounced off with a clink. She decided to put both hands on the glass and still didn't understand what was wrong. Yuri smiled, showing that she had more options than she did. She blew into Kai's neck, and he grimaced and asked her to stop. Abyss was making a face that showed she didn't know what to say. The girl thought he couldn't see it. The princess continued to seduce Kai by touching his clothes. She thought he wouldn't mind if it was in a place where no one would see, but that's not what he meant. At that moment, 
Yuri reached out to him for a kiss. The abyss took a different form and, hoping that everything was fine with the master, soon she began to beat the glass with her fist. The girl picked up speed and slammed her fist into the wall again. Yuri is getting closer to Kai. Abyss continued to try to free Kai, while Yuri was still trying to get the guy's attention. He tried to explain to Yuri that the Abyss mistook this for an emergency, and he also asked to cancel the ability. Yuri asked him not to worry, because no one would be able to harm the shelter of the War Maiden with either physical attacks or magical ones. Kai was already yelling at the girl. He tried to say that he didn't have to worry about that and repeated once again that he wasn't talking about that. Abyss was very worried. She could not save her master. She could not break through the wall. Kai called her by name in frustration and immediately turned to Yuri. He asked her to stop. He hoped she felt guilty about Abyss, and he asked me to hurry up with the cancellation of my ability. Yuri understood everything, but she wanted to stand a little longer. Because it's not often that such a chance comes, Kai tried to push her away, because he wanted to temporarily move from this shelter to Tenohira. But Yuri stopped him by covering his mouth. He didn't understand what was going on with Yuri. She tried to say something, but lowered her eyes to the floor and let go of his hand from his mouth. There was already a strong rumble in the castle. Abyss began to use fire magic and two fireballs appeared from her hands. There was a buzzing everywhere. Kai realized that since the punches didn't work, she must have decided to burn him. Kai spoke loudly to Yuri because if she didn't stop it, he would be very angry. He had already shouted at her, addressing her by her full name Yuri Cecile. The girl looked at him with sad eyes and then lowered them. She realized that she didn't seem to have any other choice. Yuri removed the wall, which surprised Abyss. She ran to Kai at the same moment. At this moment, Yuri's face completely showed that she was upset. Abyss jumped into a bear hug to Kai, who couldn't breathe. She immediately looked at him to make sure that everything was okay. She thought he was worried, so she tried to help him. He replied that he was fine and thanked her. Yuri said that Abyss was too caring, and she gave unnecessary advice that if she continued, Kai would get tired of her too. The guy immediately called out to her. She resentfully turned to Kai because she wanted to ask him if she was a magician, because magicians are the fighting force of the country, and she asked to be allowed to remind him that they exist to fight on the front line at the most difficult moment. However, he, she thought about the following words for a bit. In the end, she said that she understood that Kai had special feelings for Abyss, but as king and as her lord, he should not let feelings influence his decisions. Kai understood why she was considered a fighting force, but Abyss was not like that. Yuri was trying to figure out what she was like. The guy wondered who she was, a friend, an artificially created person, a savior or maybe a battle doll or a magical replicant named Abyss, or even his possession. In the end, he said that Abyss was his family anyway. Yuri shouted out that she and Sarah were also family then, and if so, she doesn't mind that Abyss will become his lawful wife, but he will have to take them too. Kai repeated her offer to marry them, and he realized that it was very similar that she had misunderstood something. After all, he and Abyss are not in such a relationship. This confused Yuri because she didn't realize that even though she was so attached to him, they weren't in a special relationship. Kai explained that Abyss has a habit of hugging and added that in any case, he now has no desire to be in a similar relationship with Yuri or Sarah. This shocked the girl. Meanwhile, Abyss grabbed onto Kai's clothes. She wanted to make sure he wasn't tired of her. Her eyes were full of hope, and Kai replied that he would never get tired of her, and that she continues to be herself and everything will be fine. The girl exhaled and promised that she would remain the same as she is now. They hugged in a very family-like way. Yuri stood disappointed and realized that Kai was also too caring. Sarah burst into the room to them, who turned to Yuri and Kai to find out if they were all right. She reported that there was an incredibly large magical reaction here a second ago. Kai replied, asking not to worry about it. Yuri continued his phrase that there was just a little quarrel between the lovebirds. Sarah breathed out a sigh of relief, 
saying that it made her worry. Yuri asked Kai if she could ask him a question. Kai was very interested, and at that moment, Abyss was holding onto his hand tightly. The girl wondered what kind of blessing he had, which shocked Kai. She asked this question because she had never heard of the power that creates a village that only its owner can enter. And moreover, she can produce food and water for them, as well as materials for building a castle. But at the same time, he can take an unlimited number of resources and instantly move them out of the scorpion. She believed that this power could not simply be described by the word amazing. She knew that the religion of the god Farley hides many secrets. But even so, Kai thought about it. Yuri, as expected, he cannot reveal this secret. The guy denied it was a good chance. After all, since they live here, he can no longer hide the truth about this island, how it all turned out. But he asked them to remember that they would not be able to forget it. If the temple finds out that they know this, then in the worst case they can be destroyed. Sarah and Yuri exchanged glances and immediately lowered their eyes. Hot tea was poured into the mug and Kai continued that he had received a blessing from the god Elamilla. He didn't know what kind of god he was, but he could tell for sure that the temple mistook him for an evil god, and even in the temple itself, only a part of the saints know about him, and the children who have received the blessing of Elamilla are banished to this island. That was the whole secret. Sarah and Yuri were surprised by his words and each repeated his last words. Yuri understood what was going on and Kai confirmed her guess, saying that he was captured in the middle of the ceremony and thrown onto this island, and originally, this island was full of monsters, so he and Keed should have been destroyed long ago, like the other children thrown here before him. Sarah was surprised that Keed was also blessed by Elamilla. This was confirmed by Kai. The girls started talking to each other. Sarah said that speaking of her, this girl's strength was also quite interesting. Yuri remembered that she makes the dolls move. Kai interrupted their thoughts on this matter and said that her power was something more. After all, she could literally give birth to dolls and golems, and it was amazing. Yuri said that there are some oddities because the main god is Farley and there are 13 minor gods. Or as they thought, it turned out that there was also an evil god among them. Kai stopped the girls, asking them to listen to him. While he held up his finger, three gods were revealed by the temple, Luke, who was the god of light, Idea, who is the goddess of truth, Medina, who was the goddess of healing, and in the book of Father Kai, who was a priest, there were the names of the other seven gods, Rusalia, Line, Lepios, Molto, Ritmi, Mitra, Salus. Kai said the last three weren't even in Dad's books and he thought they were intentionally hidden. Then it turned out that either Alamel was one of the last three gods, or had nothing to do with them, and just called an evil god. Kai didn't understand it. Sarah suggested that this was probably the last option, because they even went as far as exile to hide the existence of an evil god, so he must have been one of those thirteen. Yuri also thought that it was true. She thought about Farley's religion, because there were also several temples in Mondial, and they were also rooted in people's daily lives. But she could not think that they were doing something like this. The blessing ceremony is specially held only in large cities, because this way they can find and expel children who have received the blessing of Elamilla, and if you think about it, then everything falls into place. Kai agreed. And if you want to deal with everything in one fell swoop, the easiest way is to get everyone together. They suggested that the one who passes sentence is most likely a priest in a black robe, who is called an inquisitor. Yuri thought so too, because there was someone similar during the ceremony. Sarah jumped up and asked them to wait a minute. She realized that if they found someone else with Elamilla's blessing, then more children would arrive on this island. The Abyss also confirmed this, but said that they are not brought at any time, but only in the spring, a large ship arrives to throw out the cursed children. Sarah was annoyed. Kai didn't understand why they didn't just destroy them themselves, but left them on a desert island in a distant sea. He just didn't understand it. The guy also said that while he is alive, he is not ready to give up and does not want to disappear. He wanted to let the children who were thrown out here live. That was the first reason he wanted to create a country here. There was silence at the table and Sarah realized that if the temple found out that the people with Alamilla's blessing were still alive, Kai didn't know what they would do then. He thought that maybe they wouldn't do anything if they just stayed on this island, or maybe they would send an army here to gain control. 
Yuri fidgeted with her hands, and said that if the temple became their enemy, it would be the strongest of them, and they will be obliged to make their country stronger. Kai agreed. He got up from the table and stretched, then fell on the bed. He laughed in his thoughts at a powerful country, and remembered his past life. Because if you are weak, then you will not even be able to defend the right to live. Therefore, when the time comes, he will not regret it. Abyss came up to him and plopped down on the bed with him falling on his arm and blowing into his ear. What made him blush and scream, he didn't understand why she did it, and she replied that Yuri did it. If it doesn't bother him, then she wants to do it too. The guy was amazed that Abbas began to feel a sense of rivalry. She breathed into his ear once more, and he screamed that it bothered him and asked him to stop, and he repeated it again. He tried to catch his breath while lying on his side. Abbas turned to the master and hovered over him, Turning once more, she said that she would definitely protect him from the people from the ship and from monsters. After a short silence, the girl added that she would protect him from Yuri too. Kai laughed and thanked Abbas. It calmed him down a bit, but since it's true that he doesn't know what Yuri is thinking. After all, she has united everyone for him. And she is also thinking about his future. That's why he asked Abbas not to be mad at her. The girl said that since he said so, she would not be angry. Kai added that besides, as Yuri said, if the temple becomes their enemy, then they will need to make the country stronger. He thought about the strength and combat power. While looking at the little warriors, he moved to Tenohira. There was a sign about the shortage of raw materials. Kai turned to Enel, who was eating noodles at the time. He wondered if she had something suitable as a weapon for warriors. The elf laughed in surprise. In response, she wanted to know who they were already going to fight against, against humans or monsters. Kai calmly believed that he was against people. Enel said that everything would depend on the enemy's weapons because the highest warriors would have a hard time against archers. Kai noticed that they still did not have iron. The elf interrupted him and cheerfully drew his attention to the inhabitants, because thanks to Kai, who brought iron tools such as knives, farm tools, and all that spread among the villagers. Kai was shocked that the residents were able to make iron tools. Enel added that itinerant merchants began to come, which surprised Kai even more and he looked at the residents in great shock. The elf added that they most likely traded various items with traveling merchants. The guy did not understand how they appeared and assumed that they were natural. He was also very interested in this and thought that a little later he should check out the village. Enel said that since these things were not created by the villagers, so she would not be able to give them to him. While the girl apologized and she suggested instead to look at the sign, she thought that he had not tried the seed fusion yet. It also amazed the guy. The elf suggested trying to do this, and just this can affect the kind of warriors. The guy agreed. He had two seeds in his hand. He paid attention to them and said that these two red seeds that were in his hand would be able to merge. At the same second, he was just using the seed fusion. A strong glow appeared and opening his hands there was one grain, but already purple in color. This was confirmed by Enel. Kai did not understand what would grow out of this seed, but as it turned out, the elf did not know this either, but she was sure it was something useful. The guy was amazed at her lazy response. A few more days passed. Kai came to Tenohira and held a warrior in his arms. He immediately turned to Enel, showing his new little warrior. Next time, he was already planning to merge two purple seeds. Enel, in turn, waved her hands and congratulated Kai. Because religion appeared in the village, he was very shocked by this turn. A few days ago, the village of Tenohira, Kai believed that this was no longer just a pioneer village, because it was a village of unsurpassed size. Then he noticed a sign, as it turned out it was a store, which surprised Kai. He opened the door and looked inside. There was a girl sitting at the machine, who, hearing a creak, wanted to say welcome. But as the door opened, it closed. The girl ran to the exit. She was trying to find a man who wanted to come into her shop. She thought it was the wind, but then one of the floorboards creaked. The girl became scared, and she tried to figure out who was here. Then the door opened again, and there stood a young man who greeted his assistant, and she screamed loudly. The young man did not understand why she screamed like that, and the girl exhaled with relief, because it was only a merchant. He thought she sensed someone's presence and wanted to make sure she wasn't imagining it. She stammered and began to deny it. Her grandfather constantly told her that something strange had been happening in the village for a long time. 
She asked to listen to him carefully because she was sure that the strange noise would be repeated again. He just laughed, which embarrassed the girl. As it turned out, the merchant noticed that the hoe was hanging in the air. Footsteps and footsteps began to sound on the floor. The hoe fell into place and the door opened again. There was a loud cry of fear. Enel congratulated Kai because religion was born in the village. He was very embarrassed. He was trying to figure out why it had suddenly happened. She happily repeated his question and then abruptly became serious. She began to list his actions, starting with the fact that Kai was inspecting the village and rumors began to appear among the villagers. And these rumors were about floating things doors opening by themselves and disappearing food supplies. Kai awkwardly recalled his invasion of the gun store, but he still didn't understand how it turned into a religion. Enel was cheerful again and said that she had addressed the residents, telling them that it was all the work of Kai. The guy realized that it was 80% of her fault. He asked for a minute, because she said they were bowing to Kai the mischief elf or something. It didn't make him some kind of evil god. The girl shouted that it was not true, because she told them that thanks to Kai, who brought different items for everyone, the village was able to develop. The guy froze at the same moment. Enel did not understand what caused him to have such a reaction. He thought that was really how she explained it to them. It's just that the village was a world that was created thanks to his ability. He didn't think it was okay to tell them about it. The elf sighed. She said she hadn't told them that much information. Another elf picked up on their conversation and said that even if he wanted to teach them, the villagers wouldn't understand it anyway. Kai became a little sad, and Enel did not understand what the problem was. The guy realized that if he disappeared, this village would disappear with him. The elf confirmed his words, but even if this world exists because of his ability, he would like the villagers to live without knowing about it. He began to think that this was a complete lie. The elves stood behind him and looked at each other. Enel said that he should try hard to live a long time and he also has to eat a lot of delicious food. The elves began to say with one voice that they would help him in any way they could, and they also offered to try together. Then Kai remembered that Enel and the other villagers shared their fate with his. He hoped that one day he would be able to show them the world beyond the pioneer village, and will also continue to raise the level of Tenohira. And without finishing, his thoughts were interrupted by Enel, who wanted to draw his attention to the unveiling ceremony of the statue. The guy turned his head in surprise at the opening statue. The canvas was removed and in front of Kai's eyes. There was a stone Kai holding an orange in his hand. The guy opened his mouth in surprise, and Enel stood with a wide smile. Kai wanted to say something about religion, but the elf immediately interrupted him. She said it was a monotheistic religion, worshipping Kai. He is the god of creation, bringing the objects they need, and sometimes he comes to the village and plays pranks. Kai laughed and admitted that it was about right, but he was thinking that because of faith he had been exiled, and now he himself had become an object of faith. He thought it was very ironic. There were sounds of clacking in the forest. The little warrior was cutting down a tree, but his axe broke. Kai thought that even a stone axe was not strong enough for a warrior. Keed suddenly said that the royal guard had said that he would like a sickle to harvest wheat. The guy considered it a shame because he couldn't bring iron products from the pioneer village. But the girl continued that even if they didn't cut them down, they could always get a tree from the pioneer village. Kai said he was going to develop them to the point where they could take care of themselves without Tenohira's help. He would also like to expand their cultivated land, and also wants to stock up on firewood to maintain immunity in winter, because the winter on this island is very cold. Keed opened her mouth in amazement, because she realized that it was snowing here, after which she laughed and said that it probably didn't snow here. But it snowed a little last night. Kai woke up and realized that it was getting chilly at night. Then Abus came and turned to the gentleman. She leaned on the board of the bed and said that if he was cold, she would keep him warm. But Kai said that since they had worked so hard to provide Abbas with her own room, it would not be good if she slept with him all the time. But then the girl said that she was a great futon of the gentleman and wanted to make sure of her words. Kai asked her to stop and asked her not to mention his shameful statements while he covered his face with his hands because he was very embarrassed. Besides, she said that the gentleman might suddenly disappear. The guy said he wasn't that weak, but he wasn't sure what he was saying. But in any case, he would go and quickly check Koromo's winter clothes, 
so she could sleep in her room today. Abbas stretched out her hand towards the gentleman, and he moved to Tenohira. The girl was very upset by his behavior and fell on the bed. Still not quite moving, he was pulling on a shoe. The guy turned to Koromo because he wanted to know if she knew what a sweater was, namely large winter clothes with a thick lining. But instead of answering, he heard Enel and Koromo begin to cheerfully congratulate him because he has reached the 25th level. The guy was happy with his level because it was a quarter out of a hundred. Koromo said that the foundation of religion was a decisive factor. Kai thought that something new had been discovered. Enel looked at the sign and said that television was open. While noting that it was written there, Kai was very surprised by this. Televisions appeared in the houses of the residents. Kai awkwardly looked at the televisions, and Enel confirmed that they were. The guy didn't understand why he was standing at her house, but the elf herself did not know the reason. Kai thought that it was possible to watch programs from Earth through them, but Enel thought that this was not the case and invited them to take a look. Elf looked at the instructions that it allows you to inspect the place where Kai used the ability. He couldn't believe it, but it solved one of Tenohira's weaknesses. Enel said that now she too can see what is happening in the outside world. Kai thought thought it was because of his desires, but the elf really liked it, so she expected it. She said that when Kai does something obscene, it will be like getting a simple unobstructed view of everything. This confused Kai and Koromo, he didn't understand what kind of double-edged sword it was. Enel decided to turn on the TV right now. There was a noise and a bed appeared on the screen, which was huge. The guy explained that it was all because he came here before going to bed. Abbas was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling. The elf saw Abbas. At first she thought she was sleeping, but then she saw that she was just waiting. The girl did not understand what she was looking at. He suggested that, apparently, she didn't need to sleep much. Kai thought that she was just waiting for him, but then she started calling him and said that she was the futon of the Lord. This made Kai and Koromo blush. Enel said it was time for him to go and pamper her, and she'll be looking forward to it. But Kai said that she was already in observer mode, and he also thought that as long as Enel was having fun, then everything was fine. The guy returned to his world and told Abbas about it. He blushed and held out his hand to her, saying that one way or another, they could go to sleep together. Unexpectedly for him, the girl threw herself on his neck and hugged him. Kai didn't understand why she was in adult form. Abyss replied that the adult form warms better. Enel and Koromo were sitting at the table and experiencing different emotions, one smiling and the other blushing. Enel liked their relationship. Kai thanked Abyss, as usual, for her warmth. Morning came, the big tree stood out from everyone as usual. Kai and the warrior were standing on this very tree. It had been two years since his arrival on this island, but he had practically no opportunity to explore its northern part. He looked down at his village and made sure that the orchards and wheat fields were in perfect order. Onion, turnip and garlic begin to sprout, but they still had a road ahead which was fraught with uncertainty. This was due to the lack of any entertainment. He drove a stake into the branch he was sitting on. He went down to stick a stake in the ground. The guy moved to Tenohira, and the warrior ran up the tree to stick a peg with the inscription east. He moved and Sarah immediately turned to him. He looked at her in surprise, and she began to apologize because she had come about the ingredients for lunch. Kai told her, before she could finish, that she looked terrible, and then I realized that she was on fire. The girl was red and staggered a little. She told him it could be, but she was dizzy, but it wasn't such a big problem. She thought that everything would be fine if she continued to work. Kai shouted that she couldn't work in this condition because it was worse than Keed last time. He called the warriors and asked them to escort Sarah to her room. They immediately carried her on their backs. Sarah was lying in her bed, and the warriors were covering her with a blanket. Kai came to Keed, who realized that Sarah was not well. The guy confirmed it and said it got a lot colder this morning. Keed immediately decided that she would take care of her. But Kai asked her to wait because the disease might spread, so he wanted to ask Abbas or Ren to do it. The girl asked again, and the guy confirmed, and added that this is why you need to wash your hands and rinse your throat thoroughly. After all, he bought a lot of soap in Scorp. He thought everything would be fine as long as they were warm, drinking and getting enough sleep. But still, his gaze fell on the worker who was coughing. Kai realized that they couldn't get rid of it. If the disease progressed, 
it would be fatal. He came to the kitchen, where the girls were cooking and washing dishes. He turned to Yuri and decided to talk about tonight's dinner. Since Sarah had caught a cold, he would like something easily digestible, if, of course, it was possible. Kai suggested eggs that were completely dietary. Buffalo milk is considered very nutritious, oranges are rich in vitamin C, and he would prefer something warm to boost immunity. Sarah repeated his words about completely dietary eggs, new rustic shoes, a fixed fee, e-moon. The girl with the tail said that if it was something like a cold, then it would pass in the shortest possible time if you drink meat. Another said that a hot compress is best, and another girl said that nothing is available to them now. Kai was wondering if there was a way to cure a cold. Yuri replied that there are potions sold in the temple, but that's it. For mild diseases, this is an excellent treatment, but one bottle costs five to six small gold coins. Kai thought that it was like a month's earnings, because the temple knew exactly how to rob people. However, if they had the remedy, he had to buy it because his people could catch a cold any day. He wondered if they would be able to survive this winter. After all, he was the one who brought them to this island, and he is responsible for everyone's life. He repeated and repeated that he had a responsibility. Yuri turned to Kai, saying that they have a warm house here, the warmth coming from the fireplace, the food they cook together, the clothes Kuromo makes, it was all very touching. The chefs began to cheer him up, telling him not to worry about it. After all, thanks to Kai, they were no longer afraid of winter, and although they may not have everything, they don't lack anything. The guy stood upset, and Yuri said that they had said everything correctly, because everyone would survive. Kai cheered up and agreed. The girl continued, saying that wintering is also important, but when spring comes, they need to focus on their combat power. Kai became sad again, remembering about the combat power. Yuri said that even if they live hiding on the island, one day they will still be discovered. And if that happens, then won't it be a one-sided war? The guy thought about it, because they must properly develop their defensive potential. Because the country of Yuri was destroyed due to the lack of military power, so she asked to be spared from it a second time. Kai agreed without a doubt. He thought that let's say they had a battle on the island, it was surrounded by rocks, and the landing sites were limited. Tactics of taking advantage of geographical location. He finally found a way out. Kai remembered that he didn't have a map, and they needed to make one urgently. Yuri thought he was referring to the map of the island. He said that she was too, but he meant the map of the world. Ink appeared in his hands, and he spread out a scroll on the table. First of all, he turned to Abbas, asking her to draw a map of the world and for her to put in everything she knows. The girl understood everything and started writing the map. The man said he had never seen such a detailed map of such a large area. Abbas pointed to the map showing where their island was, and then she pointed to the city where they went once, namely to Scorpa. Yuri also pointed to the map, showing where the territory of Mondial was, but now this territory belonged to the Empire. Kai wanted to know where the Empire would be at that time. She wasn't sure how much they had expanded their territory. She drew a semicircle on the map, saying that it was all around the empire, Kai realized that this was a large part of the western continent. The guy turned to the residents to find out if they know which countries produce iron or trade it. Everyone was thinking seriously. One girl had flashbacks of something. She wanted to ask her friend if a Magni Federation merchant had come to them to discuss iron. Kai was immediately interested. The girl said that she heard their conversation when she accompanied the prime minister, and in the end they couldn't agree on a price so he left them like that. Kai was trying to make sure that this was the Magni Federation they were talking about. Suddenly, one of the girls pointed out on the map that Maggie was being found here, right south of their island. Kai thought about it, and said that their next destination, while learning from the others that they thought of the Magni Federation as the best option. He was silent and pondered, then looked at the people and wanted to know if anyone knew the location of the Kingdom of Laverda. Everyone was silent. Yuri doubted that they had ever traded with Mondial and asked for his forgiveness. Kai became sad and so did Keed. Morning came, and the guy was standing near the ship under construction. The girl brought some food and Kai thanked her for it. Keed noticed that the ship was much larger than the last time. Kai said that Ren is also coming with us this time. 
but he still lacks security. The girl became sad and remembered something. She asked to take her with her because she was sure she could be useful. Kai looked at her sadly and Ren turned to him because she thought that Ki wanted to find her family on her own. She thought he could do something. Kai looked at the girl sadly and said they couldn't take her on board with them. Ki really hoped that she would go with them, so she was sad. But Kai said that he would be able to show her the city, which surprised the girl. She didn't understand how he would do it. And the guy replied that there were two pegs in the pioneer village, on an island. If you place another one in the city after crossing the ocean, then she will be able to walk back and forth between the islands and the city through the pioneer village. They don't have enough time to conduct a full-scale search. But since it is a port city, there may be information about Keed's hometown. However, up to that point she might feel lonely, so he wasn't sure of his decision. The girl said that was enough. She thanked him and said she would be waiting for him. Kai was thinking that he really wasn't her equal. Ren tried to find out if everything was okay, but the girl confidently said that everything was fine. After all, she must do everything in her power to help. After all, it had gotten a little colder this morning, so she needed to stay warm and drink a lot. She repeated once again that she needed to stay warm and the idea of a bath came to her. Keed thought that if she did something like a big warm bath, would everyone like like it. Ren enthusiastically supported the idea of a bath. She thought it was a great idea because this cutie never took a bath properly. The girl remembered that she had only bathed in cold water. Ren confirmed it and decided to tell my lord about it. Winter has passed and there are signs of spring in the air. Kai announced that they were sailing to shop. Departure in the direction, the Magni Federation. The ship sailed away from the shore and began to cut through the water, which was surprisingly calm. Ren Kai and Abbas enthusiastically awaited new adventures. Enel was apologizing for the delay, and she had a tray with four mugs of tangerine juice in her hands. Kai was sitting at the table with Ren and thanked Enel for the drinks. The guy noticed that it was so convenient to sit at the exit of the village. He also noticed that Abai was still sulking. The girl was sitting on the ship and held in her hand a square that glowed. She was very bored. Kai and Ren returned, and Abai said welcome back calling Kai the master. The guy said they didn't have to go anywhere today, so they could chat. The girl was happy about it and agreed. Ren said that if there was an element of evil in Kidoku village, then Abai would probably go with them too. Kai didn't know where to get it. They left the island. The twelfth day has arrived. Ren turned to the resting gentleman with satisfaction. The girl saw the ground and wanted to know if they could go in there. The guy agreed, but saw that there was no pier, so they decided to go along the coastline. A girl was watching them. She was sitting in a tree and watching a passing ship. The shore on this island was still not visible. Kai mockingly said that it was really easier to climb a mountain, but they didn't have time to despair. The girl began to sniff and marvel at the size of the mountain. But she also felt monsters there. Kai asked Ibis to go to the top of the cliff and stick a stake on the top there. She agreed and took on an adult appearance. Immediately she quickly pushed off the deck and galloped up the rocks. Ren said that Kidoku is from there, as in the palm of her hand. Abyss drove a stake into the ground and almost immediately Kai and Ren appeared. Kai looked at the map and tried to figure out the approximate distance to the place where the city might be. Abyss said it would take about half a day to get to the nearest city. The guy enthusiastically said that in any case, they should help him climb the mountain. Bai told him to rely on her, and Ren said that whatever the monster was, she would roast it. Kai, trying to climb the mountain, managed to fall into the swamp. With the help of Abyss, climb the cliff wall, and with the help of Ren, escape from the monster that they met along the way. The sun began to set over the horizon. The guy was standing all dirty and with a branch in his hair, trying to squeeze out a smile and indicate that it was not necessary for everyone to climb up together. The girls, in turn, stood without a scratch. Abbas did not understand what the master was going to do now. Ren assumed that he would go deeper into the island. The guy denied it and said that, like last time, he would make a phase transition in their hands. Ren said it was a mean act, but Kai didn't agree with her. Abyss said that climbing the mountain was too easy for him, that's why he had to go to the end then. The fox said that when she hammered the stake, 
she would give the signal, and he just had to stand here with the warrior for a little while. The girl said with one voice that they had left and Kai was left alone with the warrior. The girls immediately came across a group of monsters that looked like rabid monkeys. They rushed towards them with a loud scream, trying to destroy them. But Ren and Abyss were ready for battle and sent them away from them. At the same moment, many monkeys scattered through the bushes which caused a loud crunching of branches, which reached as far as Kai, who in turn scratched his eyebrow and said after them, come on, which meant that he was waiting for them. Almost immediately, a column of smoke appeared on the mountain right in front of him. He realized that this was the same sign that Ren was talking about. Abyss stuck a peg in the ground and Kai appeared at the same time who started thanking the girls for their help. Abbas warned the guy that there were more monsters than she thought, so he had to be even more careful, and they moved on. The guy noticed that although this forest was thicker, it was easier to walk through it than in their forest, so he didn't see anything complicated here. He remembered that they had talked about a lot of monsters. Therefore, I decided to say that it has also become unsafe in cities today. Suddenly, the guy sat down as if he couldn't breathe. Ren didn't understand what happened. Happened. But Kai replied that they were back in this place, and it was like they were walking in circles. Abyss calmly assured him that everything was fine, and they would soon reach the top. But he was still not sure and thought that she had a GPS, because they could easily get lost. But he realized that it was no longer worth going down today, so he decided to suggest finding a place to camp. Because after all, the monsters were pretty scary. Ren saw something coming down from the sky. A bird-like silhouette appeared in the gap between the trees. Kai looked at the sky and assumed it was a big bird or a monster. Ren said she didn't feel any intention from him to attack them. She tried to figure out what it was, and also at first thought it was a bird. But she realized from the energy that it was a man. In front of them, a girl was hanging in the air, with large eagle wings behind her back and bird paws instead of legs. Everyone was very surprised by such a bright appearance. The bird man was trying to figure out what they were doing in such a place. Kai saw half-humans for the first time and looked closely at the surprised bird. She asked him if he knew that this mountain was a forbidden territory. The guy threw up his hands in denial and tried to stop the half-bird because he didn't know about it. After all, they sailed from other islands. The guy explained that they were looking for a city and thought that if they climbed the mountain, they would immediately find it. The bird thought they were lost and then finally became convinced of it and lowered her eyes. The girl looked up sharply and asked to explain something to her. Kai immediately agreed. She wondered if these girls were his maids. Kai was shocked by her question and said that they were not maids, but his family. The bird couldn't believe his ears and called them beastmen, which made both the girls and the guy think Kai corrected her saying that they were not beastmen and not his mate. The little girl understood everything, namely that there was a man standing in front of her while she smiled sweetly. After that, she noticed that the sun was already setting and she wondered what he would do. Kai replied that they were going to stop somewhere near the top and then look for cities. The man offered the bird to go to her village, which surprised the guy very much. He wondered if her village was close, and the girl replied that she was right here, inside the mountain. Kai thought about the village deep in the mountain. He studied the girl and said that she didn't look as scary as Evis, and she probably had a lot of friends. The girl said they didn't have anything, but she could offer a place to stay. The guy said that if they didn't disturb her, then they didn't mind, after which he introduced himself, and then introduced the girls saying about Abai that she is horny and about Ren that she is shorter. And he also introduced the little warriors who greeted the bird girl, whose name was Ribble, and she was a siren. She turned to Kai, asking him to follow her. The guy was trying to remember who the sirens were, because he had read something about them in a book from his father's archive. But this was the first time he had seen a real siren. He wondered why they had built the city inside the mountain and how far it was. Ribble replied that he was relatively close, she was interested to get an opinion from the point of view of a traveler about her appearance, because she thought she looked weird. Kai replied that he hadn't noticed anything like that and didn't understand why she was asking such questions. But the girl replied that this mountain, which had opened up to their eyes, had become something of a sanctuary for them, and most of the people living in the village have never seen people, and there was a reason for that because they lived in this mountain secretly. 
so the villagers kept a secret about her. Kai hesitated, because as soon as she met them, she immediately told them everything. He wondered if she was okay. Ribble turned around in surprise and said that she was fine, but he was just good. The guy smiled and thought that the girl was too naive. It was getting hotter as we approached the village. Ribble said she would clarify the situation now and come back, so they should wait a bit. Kai stood with a serious face, and Ribble ran away into the depths of the village, which looked very interesting. There were houses in it, which stood on poles, while it looked like nests. The guy thought that this was a run-down village, and he was sad about it. Ren turned to Kai, saying that it would be better if he refused, but he did not agree, saying that, on the contrary, it was better for them to stop here. Ren didn't understand why, but Kai replied that there was no other way to thank them for saving them. At this time, Rubel was already returning to them, followed by two birds, an eagle, and an owl. The girl asked to explain the situation to them and come. Several more birds began to wonder where they came from, to which Kai replied that they were from the sea, and the other bird also thought that the two girls behind him were his maids. One of the birds, hearing that they had arrived from afar, realized that they must be tired. He said they didn't have anything, but they could have a good rest here. Kai thanked them cordially for the warm welcome, but he still did not understand what kind of village it was and saw that there were no other girls except Ribble here. The girls were exploring the village, while Kai greeted the villagers, who repeated that they had nothing, but they could have a good rest here. How he was still thanking them for the reception, but they were still trying to figure out that the girls were not servants. At that time, the girls tried to call the master's gaze on them. They said that they were not maids, but that they were a family. The bird was apologizing to them. Kai turned to Ribble because she also thought that the girls were servants, but he did not understand why. The girl replied to him that they were beastmen, and it was a bad person who could tame a beastman, which is already interesting. The guy was shocked and repeated her question. She told him in response that they didn't look like a bad person so he could tame them. Kai felt awkward and said that everything was not as simple as it seemed, but Ribble had already run up to the other bird. Kai reflected that although they live in secret, they obviously are not afraid of strangers. They hide the very existence of the village, but there were no secrets inside the village itself. The little warrior looked at the beetle flying by. Kai noticed this because the warrior started crawling after the beetle and dropped the stone. The guy bent down to pick it up and realized that it looked like coal. He began to examine it and realized that it was not him, because he was as heavy as a stone and assumed that it was iron. After that, Kai looked around the village and realized that there was nothing else here. He didn't understand how he got here. At that moment, a bird came up to him who thought that he was interested in this stone. Kai replied that he was just thinking what it was. The bird said he thought it was an iron stone because they found it while they were plowing the ground. The guy was very happy and immediately beamed. He suggested to the bird that he give him this iron stone. The bird was a little scared and said that she could exchange it for something equally valuable. The bird asked for forgiveness because he had already promised it to another. Kai did not give up and said that when he came, they would try to negotiate. After all, he thought that he would offer better terms than the last deal, and they would be able to negotiate right here. The bird looked at Rubel, who was accepting a gift from another bird, and he understood his feelings. But he asked for forgiveness because he couldn't do that because he had given his word, and he didn't know if he could find another one. The guy became sad and understood everything, while looking at the boxes filled with pieces of iron and covered with a cloth. They were sitting in a house that had been kindly provided for them, and yet, Kai still couldn't understand why the deal to buy a piece of iron was so vital to them. Kai was also worried about the lack of girls in the village. The guy noticed that Rubel was cooking dinner. He was wondering if everything was okay. The girl turned her head and did not think that he was talking about it, because she had already cooked and it was an ordinary wheat porridge. The girl awkwardly lowered her head and held on to the hand of the bowler hat through a cloth. She opened the lid and there was porridge with various local herbs. Kai was surprised that this wheat porridge was ordinary boiled water. But since she tried so hard trying to cook food for the guests, they had to try it. Kai put his hand to his forehead as a sign that he was very disappointed, but nevertheless thanked the girl and wished her a pleasant appetite. Rubel was very pleased with his reaction and that he was happy to taste her porridge. The guy also decided to give her something in return 
because they also brought food with them. The girl was looking forward to finding out what Kai would give her. He took a sweet potato out of his bag. The girl was so excited and tried to make sure she could take it. Kai smiled and held out a pot of porridge, thereby reminding them that they had tasted her dish. The girl sat down on the hole that served as a door and window and thanked Kai. She said she was going to eat it with the others. The guy felt embarrassed by this reaction. But Rubel shouted at the whole village so that everyone could hear her. Kai was sitting next to Ren in a prayer position, and the guy was glad that it was good that they didn't take Keed with them. Ren agreed, but although Ki is behaving quite mature for her age, so without unnecessary questions and words, I would just drink Rubel's porridge. Kai turned to Ren and said that she was holding up well too. Evening came and yesterday's porridge turned out to be very salty. The stars were shining above the mountains, and everyone was asleep. Kai was woken up, it was Abbas, who woke him up with care. Ren heard that they were coming, a ponytail appeared in the door. It was Rubel, who was apologizing for waking everyone up. But they had to wake up. Kai didn't understand why, because it was midnight. But Rubel was glad that Kai woke up. He said that she had talked to her father not so long ago, and that night they decided to take them closer to the city. Although they agreed that people were forbidden to be in this village, but there are quite a lot of people at the entrance to the mountain. Kai asked if there were many residents or someone else. Rubel confirmed and said that when they go down to the city, if they are, someone will ask. Then you can't tell the residents of the city anything about them. Kai understood everything, but he needed time to prepare. The girl smiled sweetly and told them to come down as soon as they were ready because they would be expected. Ren tried to address the gentleman, but he already knew everything. He went to Tenohira to get more sweet potatoes because he had already prepared for this in Kidoku. Ren was delighted that she opened her mouth in surprise. Kai didn't know what else people like birds, but they were so excited about sweet potatoes, that's why he brought them more sweet potatoes. Ren laughed and said that with this alone, they would not need food for a long time. Kai was the last to go down the stairs and inspect what the birds had prepared for them. Rubel showed them where to sit and warned them that they would be a little shaky. The place where they had to sit was a cloth from which four strips of cloth separated. Kai was surprised that they needed to sit here, but the girls didn't say anything. There was fear on the guy's face, he thought it was a joke. But in the end, all three of them sat on this cloth and Kai was in the middle. The bird soared into the dark sky and the sky burst with the screams of a guy, and the girls sat and enjoyed the beauty of the mountains. Tears welled up in Kai's eyes. He was very high, and he asked himself not to look down, the guy was very scared, because he understood that if he fell, he would disappear. Finally, they began to land. Abbas said it was fun, and Ren laughed because the gentleman was very afraid. Kai was trying to catch his breath a little. Rubel said goodbye to Kai and put her finger to her mouth, thereby repeating that he should not tell anyone about them. The guy agreed and thanked everyone for everything, because they really helped them. Rubel said that she was also glad to talk to the stranger for a long time. Finally, she once again pointed out where the city was and wished them good luck. Kai waved at her and told her that they would meet again. When the girl had already taken off into the sky, he shouted to her that inside the house where they lived, he had left them a gift in gratitude, and for them to eat together, Rubel thanked him again, and she started waving goodbye. And so their carriage was heading towards the city gate. Ren and Abbas put on cloaks that hid their ears and horns. Ren was very surprised when she saw that Abai had cat ears instead of horns. Ren also noticed that they had arrived in the city. Kai confirmed it. Abbas asked the guy what they would do. Kai said they needed a snack first. The guy came up to the shop and asked them to give them meatballs on a stick. The man smilingly agreed. He gave everyone a snack and Kai surveyed the area. He was surprised by the large number of people, and he thought that there was some kind of celebration going on now. The shopkeeper replied that there were always so many people here. The city of Zax was one of the four main pilgrimage sites of the Feria teachings. So pilgrims from all over the world gather here every day. Kai understood everything and decided to learn about trading. He told the shopkeeper that they wanted to start trading here, and he also wanted to know what was better to sell at the store they were going to open. The shopkeeper said that a traveling merchant would not be able to open a shop here just like that. If he has goods, then he can go to the merchant's union 
because they have a monopoly on buying goods. But the market decides everything there, so he will not be able to agree on the price. Kai realized that there was only one government building. He told the shopkeeper that he would go and look in and thanked him. He informed the girls that he could not trade in the market yet, so they could start collecting information, which meant they could have called her. That meant they had to shut it down. The girls opened their cloaks and Keed appeared immediately hugging her toys. She looked at the city in surprise. She immediately ran up to the bridge. She felt wonderful because she had not been outside the island for a long time. Kai informed her that this was the city of Sax and hoped that she remembered something about it. But the girl shook her head. Kai also said that there are a lot of other travelers here, so maybe they will find someone who knows something, and they will question him. The girl agreed. 